You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we get Dan Witten. Dan, how are we? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy to be in Scotland. Um, and it's obviously been a crazy few months, but I'm sort of coming back mm-hmm. slowly but surely. I hope. You've been in the industry for nearly 20 years. Yeah. You've broke some world headlines, massive stories, contacts. You've been very controversial as well. Let's be honest. You've spoke a lot of shit. You've spoke a lot of positivity. You've done a lot of good work as well. But you've tasted the brunt of it when you see what it's like when they come after you, which we'll touch on, obviously. But first and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I think I'm doing okay now. I I cannot tell you how brutal the past eight months has been. It was Jordan Peterson. I I heard him say that being cancelled is the worst thing to go through as a human other than receiving a terminal diagnosis. And I actually think he's right because it touches on every single aspect of your life, your personal life, your family life, your financial life, your professional life, your friendships. You know, nothing is untouched when you're cancelled. But if they want you, they'll get you. Oh, yeah. And they they want control to the world, and especially with the names you're going up against. Yeah. If I'm honest, it was only a matter of time for oh, the yeah. people who know the ins and outs of how this operates. But before we get into all that, though, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get more about understanding about you, Dan, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, it's interesting. My my um, parents were what was known as 10-pound poms. So people often wonder, what's my accent about? Because I was born in New Zealand, uh, but... I am a British New Zealander. So my mum was actually born in Essex. My dad was born on a British army base in Malta, but all of his family are Geordies. So my heritage is British, but I spent the first 20 years of my life in New Zealand. So I've always had this um, dual citizenship, and that was awesome because it meant that I knew that I would be able to move to the UK. But my upbringing was really idyllic. New Zealand is a wonderful country to to grow up in. I mean, it's literally on the other side of the world. You feel very safe. But obviously for me, being gay growing up in the 90s, that was still a challenge at that point. So I think it made me, you know, I was... I was um, badly bullied and had to deal with it with a lot of flack at school. And so I think you either go one of two ways. It either breaks you or for me, it made me almost, um, maybe almost too determined to succeed. Uh-huh. What were you like at school? I mean, I was a nightmare as well. well <laughs> the yeah. teachers hated me. Yeah. Did they? Yeah. So I've never been good with authority. And as you've seen, <laughs> With my latest travails. Nothing's changed. Yeah, nothing's changed there. So no, so the teachers hated me. I mean, I was I was a difficult kid in lots of ways, but you know, I was walking down the corridor at school and being called a faggot twenty times a lunchtime. So that does something to you. It, it makes you strong and steely. So I've always been someone that words cannot hurt me. You know, no one ever physically touched me. You know, I've never been in a fight in my life, never been beaten up. You know, I'm a big guy. So it was never a physical thing with me. It was always mental and emotional. But yeah, I always challenged authority. And then I was really precocious, actually, and probably really annoying for the teachers because I um, was like a TV presenter when I was 15 years old on this cable show in New Zealand. I was like interviewing the prime minister and doing things that were very annoying and precocious. But I think for me, it's because I just wanted to escape school. You know, that was hellish for me. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be out of school. I wanted to be living. I wanted to be working. 
Did you know? Because obviously, when you came out as gay, I think it was 2011, 2013 on Twitter, I think it was then. But how was, did you know your sexuality back then? Did you oh, know yeah. you were into men straight away? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, to be honest, that is what maybe the first time I had tweeted about it. But to be honest, something I'm really proud about is that the entire time that I've been in the industry in a very masculine world, Fleet Street, and people always said it was very homophobic. And I remember when I entered Fleet Street, which was around 2007, um, my first job was at the News of the World. Lots of people told me to hide my sexuality. Uh, you know, you're never going to go anywhere if you say that you're gay. Now, by this point, my, all my friends, my family knew I was gay. And, and I made a conscious decision not to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of that. So, so I sort of hid who I was until I was about 21. You know, I had a girlfriend and, but everyone knew. <laughs> Everyone knew. Yeah, you know if somebody's just an energy about it, it's not yeah. you just know if somebody's camp or somebody's yeah. they're just but again it's down to everybody, even twenty twenty four, if we're honest, Dan, it must all be hard for people to come out. Oh yeah. Especially yeah. with social media. Back then obviously it was more ruthless. Obviously I think things have changed a little, but it must be difficult yeah. for people to then admit well, who they are. Loads of straight men are still closeted today. I mean, I know lots of married guys, you know, guys married to, to women who have relationships with men. What it actually is, is not necessarily about wider society. It's that you feel like you've been living a lie and that all of the people who love you are going to think, well, what was our relationship like before that? Now, of course, they don't do that. You know, nine times out of 10, people are incredibly accepting and will say, oh, yeah, we knew that anyway, Dan, or whatever. We just didn't ask. But remember, I was 21, um, so I was pretty young. And actually, I told my parents when I was... 15. How'd that go? Um, it wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't great. <laughs> it's Especially true. if your dad had been in the army and yeah. stuff. Well, it was my grandfather who was in the army, but my dad is like a proper bloke. You know, he's a rugby player. He was a top rugby player for um, for Wellington in New Zealand, and he trialed for the All Blacks, and, you know. But they were incredible. Absolutely incredible. But it was just a tough thing because, I mean, they... I mean, I remember my mum saying to me, she's, she, she's surrounded by gay people now, but she said, you know, I've never met a gay person. I was like, mum, of course you have. Of course you have. But it was just a different, it was a different time. But no, they took it well. But the thing is, I was still in my experimental phase, not knowing what I was going to be. And actually, that's one of the reasons now why I'm really concerned about all of this crazy gender trans stuff that's going on with kids. Now it's like, Kids can't make a decision about their sexuality when you're still going through puberty. Do, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. your hormones and everything are all over the place. So it's really only once you're sort of 18, 19, 20 that I think you can properly know who you are and, and what you want to yeah. be. Same as kids. Listen, everybody's confused. Me, you, every human is confused. And the reason being is because we don't really know what's going on in life. In my own opinion... And I've interviewed enough people to understand no matter who I interview, nobody's ever got concrete, clear no. vision of what, why we're here on this planet. Now, for giving kids puberty blockers and like, I don't care if you're straight, bi, gay, trans, be who you want to be. I've got friends in all around the world, all different races, all different ages, mm. and I love them for who they are. Mm. I've interviewed porn stars, OnlyFans, gay porn stars, and we became friends. I don't tell them they don't do that job, no. this and that, because it's their life. Everybody goes through different levels of trauma, yeah. different levels of pain to then mould them into who they are. I don't judge people for what they've done in the past. I judge people from what totally. they're doing now. And me too. But with the trans debate, to me, it's child abuse. And I, I have a really personal take on this, right? Because I am convinced, absolutely convinced, that if I was at school now, I would have some woke teacher in my parents' ear saying, oh, we think he might want to be a little girl because when you're a little gay kid, right? And only gay kids know this, you go through loads of stages. So you go through the stage where you want to dress up as a girl. You go through the stage where you play with Barbie dolls because you, you're so confused about your sexuality. You don't understand it. You're like, well, I'm not like the other boys. So maybe I'm like a girl. Now I never wanted to be a woman. 
Never in, in, in a million years. But I honestly believe that at that five, six, seven year old age now, I would have had some teachers pushing my parents down that path. And that makes me so angry and so concerned. And I do believe this stuff that's going on. You know, I've interviewed people who have um, detransitioned Kara Bell, who was the one who blew the whistle on the Tavistock Clinic, um, which was doing terrible things to basically lesbian young women, convincing them that they actually should be boys. Now, in her case, she um, had her breasts cut off. She went through puberty blockers. Her voice is deep. You know, she'll never get any of that back. And she's realized now, actually, she was just a lesbian woman. So, so yeah, so I guess my, I think I probably have quite a unique take on it as a gay guy, knowing that probably yeah. I could have been pushed down that path and it would have been so wrong. But I can respect that because it's an understanding. Just because someone doesn't agree with what you is up with you or what, how you feel doesn't mean it's wrong. Everybody sees the world differently and mm. I don't care who you are, like, leave the kids alone. Totally. If you're going to schools at 10, 11, 12, as a father myself, my job is to protect. And I could be wrong. Maybe everybody should be going to schools and dresses and drag queens and reading story times. Maybe it should be, but for me as a father, I just let my kids enjoy life. Even the school system's backwards if we totally. question that as well. Like, why are we studying fucking mathematics and other shit and history that's irrelevant? We don't even know if it's true or false anyway. So kids should be out in nature. They should be loving life. They should know about loving they should know about money management they should know about love understanding we should even talk about death as well it might be a bit mm. grim but i think when people lose someone they can spiral oh yeah they can lose their whole life just totally. from a death from 10 20 I mean, years ago seriously you are so right there is so much that we learn at school that is totally irrelevant and i look back and i think what should i have been taught at school taxes how you pay your taxes how you how you budget how you cook healthily, how you count calories. Do, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. practical things that actually, like still as an adult, I, I need to know yeah. about and you just do not learn at school. But yes, yeah, certainly not pumping your kids with information about why they might be the wrong gender. I mean, I'm very traditional on this anyway. I think there are mm -hmm. two genders. You know, I think you're either a man or a woman. But if someone wants to say that they're a woman, I don't, have a big problem with that but you can't tell people that they should be denying a scientific reality i think it's really disturbing yeah science biology chromosomes everything's there for a reason mm. but again if listen if you want to identify as a panda batman superman mm. i don't care i genuinely yeah. don't care i'll go okay fair enough but if somebody comes into me if i go to a mental institute and i see someone pretending to be batman mm. or superman I ain't going to be there long and go, okay, no. that's well done. I, yeah, yeah, you are. There's, there's yeah. something not but these are But these are mental health issues. And people, yeah. and people are too scared to say that. But I mean, I'm sorry. When we have teachers actually bringing in uh, bowls of food so that students in their class can pretend to be dogs, I'm sorry, this has gone too far. This is insane now. We've got to stand up against it. Why are they pushing it so much, though? Because the woke agenda is so powerful, isn't it? So powerful. It's connected to a much bigger picture in what's going on in the world. You know, it's all about the big globalist organizations, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum. I genuinely believe that these bodies want to effectively take control of governments all around the world and so that's why i think it's really important that governments stand up to sovereignty it's why i was um such a big supporter of brexit for example because i don't trust these globalist bodies i mean they're completely unelected i mean the united nations is pushing mad ideology about things so i think um i think the woke agenda is a dangerous agenda actually and it's not just connected to social issues, although, of course, that is part of it. But I actually think it's much more connected to being controlled. But we are controlled. As soon as we're we born, are. we're controlled, we're labelled, we're given names, religions, sports teams to support. We cut the umbilical cord straight away, which is full mm. of stem cells and nutrients. Women aren't breastfeeding, which causes abandonment issues. 
it's difficult then you're going through the schooling system where you're programmed to condition to think this is the way the world operates people aren't standing back and going wait a minute question mm -hmm. everything because you know yourself there's always three tales sides to the tale there's two sides and then there's the truth 100 percent. and i mean i didn't used to question things and i think what's really powerful is when you have that moment when you wake up and more and more people are having that moment now but i mean goodness me if you told me 10 years ago that i would be questioning the United Nations, I probably would have said, well, you've gone mad. But actually, for me, <laughs> I had two big moments of realisation. And the first was Brexit uh, in the UK, because what happened is um, you basically had international bodies working with the UK Parliament to try and overturn the democratic will of the British people, you know, the biggest democratic mandate that they'd been in British history. I mean, to me, I'm, I'm still not over that. That's crazy and it nearly happened you know it came so close to happening it was only boris johnson and that 2019 election that stopped it so that was the first one and then the second one was of course um covid where we saw the true dark forces that have the power to quite literally stop the world if they want to but the good thing is, is i think they overplayed their hand and so a lot of people now have started to wake up to this. Scary though how the world can get into lockdown, how people are standing oh. in pubs two metres apart. And it's it's silly from, yeah. I ain't, listen, I'm a, I ain't a scientist or a doctor and I still question what if I was wrong? A 99.9% .9 survival rate of something that, again, is a, just a normal flu again. But I, I, people, listen, the world is controlled with fear. So yes. pe people ain't bad for following what they're seeing on the news because people genuinely no, believe no. the government have got their people best were interest. Terrifying. Yeah, of course. So it's nothing to do with, oh, you're mm. wrong, I'm right. It's just to step back and question it all yeah. because we could be wrong as well. Well, yeah, and by the way, I've never denied the existence of COVID. I had COVID in March 2020, yeah, really same. early, and it was nasty, right? At yeah. that point, it was a nasty virus. Uh, what I always questioned was the need to lock down the world there were loads of other things that could be done and also unfortunately viruses are gonna virus and that's what happened and the only way to actually open back up is to get to herd immunity point but mm -hmm. it was just so disturbing how quickly uh governments loved the idea of completely controlling a population it shows you how easy it can be done so i think that's why now we always have to be questioning authority questioning the establishment, questioning the blob. And obviously for me, um, the biggest thing that I'm passionate about because it's my area of expertise is the media. You know, I remember I was in the mainstream media for 20 years, but I believe the mainstream media is completely corrupt and uh, doesn't always tell the truth and actually very often doesn't tell the truth these days yeah but who does and that's why it's important for people listening or watching to question everything yeah now we just a couple of conspiracy nuts get your tinfoil hat on people <laughs> saying that's fair but people jump on a trend whether it's russia ukraine yeah. whether it's palestine israel people jump on a trend of oh, yeah. what's trendy then and it's but I'm telling you history, i've been guilty of it yeah, but you history know. repeats itself consistently every hundred years we've got we've got plagues we've got fucking viruses we've got wars We've got fucking deprived people. Homelessness is on the rise. There's over 2 billion people on this planet without water. How can people be without water in this day and age, mm. 2024, with the food that we waste? Yeah. It's unbelievable how corrupt and poisonous the world can be. For me, keep yourself fit. Stay open-minded. Try and not watch as much TV. Come off your phone as well, because me and you are in the system, Dan. Mm. Even doing these sort of shows, we still crave views. We still mm. crave attention. We still crave to clear oh, our yeah. name and stuff like that. But the bottom line is, if you get cancelled or whatever it is, who fucking cares? But life goes on. People yeah. get cancelled. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Who it genuinely gives a like fuck? It. it just feels as if your whole world's come <laughs> yeah. crashing down. You've lost everything and you kind of want it back. But again, that's still ego. That's still pride because we've worked so hard to create a level of understanding 100%. and give people a platform and then to feel as if you've lost it all. It's damaging towards this. No, 100%. And I've had to realise over the past year that I have no right to a platform i didn't have a god-given right to to be on tv to to write for the biggest web news website in the world i didn't have that right but i guess what i feel heartened by is that where i see the media moving 
obviously looked at this really closely, and you're an example of this, is people want people are much more likely to trust an individual now than they are an organization. And I think they're right to do that because it's easier to see inside one human being than it is a big organization that is probably being funded by billionaires, has money coming from potentially corrupt states. And I'm heartened by that. But you're right. No one has a right to a platform. And one of the things that has been quite exciting for me, actually, now with launching my own platform is I'm going to have to earn this. I mean, I'm going to have to earn it. There is a total uh, democratization of the media now. If people don't trust me, they're not going to follow me. They're certainly not going to help fund me. And I'm not funded by anyone now apart from my audience. So I think you're completely right. A lot of it is down to ego in the mainstream media. And believe me, when you go through the sort of brutal cancellation like I've gone through, you have no ego left. <laughs> no. There, there is no, there is, I, yeah, I, I'm not saying I didn't have an ego. I mean, I most certainly did. But, uh, but yeah, when you've gone through a cancellation like that, e your ego goes. So it humbles you. Oh, yeah. But then you become a better journalist yeah. and understand people now. It's not just yeah. all one way traffic because information that you've been fed for the last 20 years, the majority of that could be bullshit. Yeah. You've just tasted that. And now it's to make amends and then go, okay, listen, I fucked up. I need to apologize to a lot of people. But there's only so many times you can say sorry without flipping the chapter and moving mm. on. What was it like having a girlfriend? <laughs> well, uh, it was, it, it was odd. It was odd. Uh, but you know, I was, um, very much in love with her, but I then learned it was something that does happen with quite a lot of gay men. So I was, uh, I was 21 and she was 40. So often a gay man is attracted to an older woman when they are working out their sexuality. Is that a mother figure they're looking for? What is that? No, I don't think it's a mother figure thing. I think it's just someone who's experienced and who is quite worldly wise. Um, but yeah, my situation was quite crazy and I've never spoken about it before, but sh she was actually the TV presenter of the show that I was working on as like a young researcher. And <laughs> she then, so we were together about 10 months or something like that. She then left me for a very famous actor, a guy called John Reese davies who played Gimli in Lord of the Rings. And he was 60. So it actually became like a bit of a story in New Zealand because I was 20, she was 40. She leaves the 20 year old for the 60 year old. <laughs> and that's when you know you're gay, mate. And if, some, <laughs> if somebody leaves you for a 60 year old, I know, I know, I know, I'm mortified. But look, it's, it feels odd now. Um, it feels odd now, but I don't really have any regrets because i think you have to sometimes go through these experiences to know yeah. who you are because people struggle people struggle to talk how they're feeling and what they are even people with addiction gambling addiction drug addiction as for me back in the day it was too much pride i couldn't admit that I was a fuck up or a failure because i thought how would people judge and now i know that everybody's the exact same we're all fucked up people relate to you more when you actually become honest so you coming out, people actually respect you more because that takes strength. People speaking about it takes strength. So when you eventually, why do you think it is so difficult for men? Because every industry, acting, uh, yeah, any yeah. industry, even the footballers, like, there's only one or two men in the UK ever come out as gay. Come on, man, there must be one in every team. I, I'm, not, I'm just making up these I numbers, know, but it must be so hard for them, especially in a yeah. manly environment. Yeah, I do have mixed views on this, being honest, though, because I mean, I was very young when I was in that relationship. And... I knew it was never going to last and I knew that, that I was gay. And what I do struggle with is, for example, you know, Philip Schofield's with his wife for decades, talks to the public about how he's in, you know, this committed relationship with a woman. Then he comes out and he's hero worshipped by the gay community. So the gay community hate me because they consider that I'm on the right, even though 
I've always been open about my sexuality for the whole time I've been in the industry, you know, from 21 onwards. But all of a sudden, Philip Schofield was a hero. And I struggled with that because I thought, well, what about his wife? What about his kids? I mean, there are, you know, look, I don't judge people. It's difficult. And also, I'm a different generation. So I was lucky. And I think the next generation, like my boyfriend's generation, it was even easier to, to, to come out. But I think you've got to be conscious of the people who you hurt, you know. So with my ex, I was very young. She was old uh, or older, my age now, actually. But, you know, I wasn't hurting her. She left me for an older guy. No damage was done. You know, you've you've got to think about sometimes who who you're hurting. So, it, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But, no, it's still very difficult to come out. Yeah. Obviously, there's loads of gay footballers. We we know that. We know, well, I'm pretty certain who some of them are. And there is still a stigma, but I think some of it comes down to a bit of personal strength and a bit of personal bravery too, because as I say, and I'm not trying to big myself up, but it was also really hard entering the Fleet Street offices in 2007 as a gay man. I mean, there was no one out and gay working on Fleet Street in any senior positions and I proved that you could do it do, do you see what I mean so mm -hmm. we need a bit of personal bravery from people too yeah but again it must be hard for people to live that lie and once it goes too far there's no turning back that's the problem Philip Schofield come on like how can you be a hero if you've lied and cheated on your wife for over 20 well, that years was, that was my issue and also you know because a lot of people you know, and it was one of the things that actually ended up leading to my cancellation because people had thought I'd been a hypocrite o over Philip Schofield. And it's like, hang on a moment. No, I've I've never lied about who I am the whole time I've been in, in the public eye. You know, once I knew that I was definitely going to be gay and I'd had the relationship with the woman and, you know, I'd had my little experimentation. As I say, I told my parents when I was 15, but that was like from the 21 years old and over. You know, I was always open about it always i mean but it's certainly not i think the other thing that's a big thing for me is i hardly ever talk about being gay i mean this is actually quite odd because for me it's such a tiny part of who i am um i hate people i don't hate them but i dislike people whose entire identity is about what their sexuality is i find that sort of quite dull do, do you know what i mean yeah. i'm an a monogamous, happy relationship with the most amazing guy you've met today, yeah, actually. Shout out to Alan. Yeah, Alan. And he's, you know, we've been together for four years. We are totally boring. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I don't, it's not a big part of me, but I do struggle, I, I do struggle with that thing of, oh, you're a hero for coming out. And I always used to find it really weird that there are sort of rules when you're working in the British media about you're not allowed to out someone, which obviously like makes sense. But sometimes there were guys who were like, everyone knew they were gay. And that, and I was like, well, why can't we say that they're dating someone? Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's sort of, if, it's, if, if there's yeah. not a stigma around it. But everybody knew Schofield was gay for years. Oh yeah. It's the oh, grooming yeah. of the T-boy that I don't understand because even the kid Jack Jones had done a video with the balloons and he was sitting yes, at yes, lunch. Yes, yes, like, yes. There's a lot of dark up there. And these people, no matter how dark it goes, they'll keep their job because of organizations losing money, losing views. Mm. And it's it's just too much business. Well, no, that, that was the thing for me because, again, with Philip Schofield, people thought that I had some sort of personal issue against Philip. I mean, he had tried to get me sacked a few times, right? So I didn't love the bloke. But it was never about that. It was about the fact that ITV had covered up this relationship. And the guy, you know, who remember I know pretty well, was in a really dark place mentally. And all of the loose women ladies um, were absolutely horrified because they were basically dealing with this guy having a breakdown on their show and I was working for The Sun at the time. I was the executive editor of The Sun. And we believed it was a legitimate story, not because it was about outing Philip Schofield, but because um, there was this cover-up 
with an ITV. Do, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, powerful forces, you know, ITV investigate themselves and clear themselves. You yeah. know, it's, it's ludicrous. But then you've got ITV, you've got BBC. Listen, people, these are powerful forces. Yeah. And like we said earlier, if they want you, they'll get you. Well, of course. They do on the media. But the thing about these platforms now, this is a new media. There's an understanding of mm. the guest. It's a longer format. Not to judge the person, but to understand the person. Anybody mm. can come on here and talk shit. That's okay with them. The thing about the UK public, Dan, we can see through bullshit. Mm. We can see through a lot of bullshit. We're quite clued up on who's real and who's totally. fake. And the media now. So, so do you remember, like, The Sun used to be considered the voice of the British public. Because this was before, or like the working class British public. Mm. This was before social media. And I think that's why The Sun was such a big force, because very often it would represent the public in a way the rest of the media wouldn't. But actually, that's really changed over the past decade, because actually, no, we're not going to allow The Sun to tell us what we think about things, because obviously The Sun went down the narrative of Philip Schofield's a hero. He's so brave. He's come out. I mean, that's just one example. That happens all the time. And you're right. The, the British public called it out and said, no, this is bullshit. We don't support him. And uh, eventually, Holly Willoughby sort of got the message and she turned. But but I think the media, or the mainstream media at least, has lost its power. And that's because of social media. But they got it. Things were starting to build up with them, especially the Queen's death when they were queuing up. Oh, yeah. Beckham was there 13, 14 <laughs> yeah. hours in the queue. If anybody should yeah. be jumping the queue, it should be Bex. Do you know what I mean? And they two. Q jumping, oh, yeah. zero fucks given. You just, you just kind of, and then people ain't daft. People don't like yeah. that shit. Well, no, why, why should I mean? I would not have even considered applying to skip the queue to see the Queen's coffin. You know, I could have. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing the primetime broadcast on GB News that whole week. I could have said, "Oh, there's no way that I could possibly line up for 13 hours." So. You've got to, I just would not have even considered it. So I do think it was a moment about entitlement. And the thing is, remember, I've, for loads of reasons, I've always been an outsider. Um, but these sort of insiders and Westminster and stuff, they do believe they're entitled and they do believe that they should be treated differently. Because remember, it wasn't just Holly and Phil that skipped the queue. You know about... God, it was loads. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah, 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 it was loads. But hundreds of media figures. They're the golden the childs of fucking... They're the, the golden couple of daytime TV, they man. They were, yeah. And they had jobs everywhere. And like I say, things change people. Yeah. No matter if it's 10 years, 20 years, things always come to the surface. When did you come to the UK, Dan? When was the first... So it was the end of 2004, and I was 21 years old. This relationship with the woman had broken up and it had sort of got into the newspapers... So I wanted to escape. But to be honest, I'd always, I mean, as I said, I was a weird teenager. Like I, my auntie who lived over in London, she used to send um, like copies of NME or The Sun, you know, because like, obviously it was pre-internet. Well, the internet was really young at that point. I'm 40. And I'd read these magazines and I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to move to the UK. I'm going to make it in Fleet Street. Um, it was my dream to, to do it. Um, and, you know, I came from, you know, my from a working class background. My parents were both teachers. Um, you know, did not go to, to public school. You know, went to, you know, a, a normal school in New Zealand. And um, in some ways it was really unlikely but I, as I say, I sort of had this determination. So when I moved over in the end of 2004, for the first um, three months, I literally had no money, nothing. So I had to keep getting little loans from my parents. But I was so determined that I wasn't going to work in a bar because that's what lots of Kiwis and Aussies come over and do. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that really really want to get a job as a journalist so i was getting really desperate but i finally got a job and it was as an editorial assistant on i mean i hated it on like a financial publication called futures and options week which was about derivatives trading and i knew absolutely nothing about it right 
and was speaking to like hedge fund managers and stuff who knew I knew nothing about it. But the point is like I had a job in journalism and it was an incredible moment. I was being paid 18,000 pounds a year. I was actually living in this flat in Acton. Um, it was a really famous flat that had been written about in the Australian newspapers, right? Because what they'd done is that divided up the attic into like 10 different partitions and literally like people would just sleep on the mattresses for like five pounds a night so there were basically 20 people living in this house like it was insane but i put up with it all because i just believed that there if i could enter journalism i thought that i would be able to make it but i didn't know anyone I had no contacts, um, you know, because it's, it is an industry where most, not most, but a lot of people get in through some sort of connection. You know, really there's not. a lot of journalism nepo babies. Where did you get that belief from? I think it was that upbringing. Well, firstly, my pa- I mean, my parents always instilled such a belief in me that I could succeed, never in an overly ambitious way. But as I say, they were teachers. They, they really believed in me. So then I believed in myself. But I think the other thing was that it was because of how badly bullied and everything that I was. I mean, there's this amazing book called The Velvet Rage. And actually speaking of Philip Schofer, when he came out, I actually recommended that he read it. Because The Velvet Rage is all about why people have been closeted when they're growing up can be really angry about a lot of stuff because it changes your personality. But the other thing in The Velvet Rage is that <laughs> you'll see, like, people say, why are, why are so many gay men so successful professionally? Because actually, you think about it, there are lots mm-hmm. of gay men, right? Especially in, like, the world of and entertainment payment, yeah. and media. And it is because when you're growing up and you're having to hide who you are and you're often being bullied for it, it gives you this sort of added determination to succeed. But what you learn, and what I certainly learned the hard way, is that professional success does not equal happiness. A million percent. This is a material world, and I've got the nice car, I've got nice watches, but people need to understand being rich is a scam. It's the biggest scam on the planet. Money's an illusion. We and fame. Us, yeah, it's a bullshit. I, I craved that because I thought that would fill the pieces. Yeah. I thought that's where I would find my completion. Yeah. I thought that's where I would strive and be happy. And the more I got it, the more yeah. miserable I become because I realised, wait a minute, this don't make me happy because yeah. money, we give it so much meaning and value for something that doesn't really exist. We kill for it, we die for it. And for what? The world is controlled by power. You take away the currency, you take away the money, people need to interact. Wars wouldn't happen if people had a conversation. It's not the young kids who are killing the people. It's the ones in suits pulling the strings and making the moves to make them rich again and make billions. So for me, being rich is a scam and I can only say that because I'm doing well now. So people need to, it's good to experience new things. I remember I got a Range Rover and I cringed because I thought that's it and I'll post photos and people think I'm doing well. I remember driving down the motorway and I was fucking unhappy. Yeah. Because I realised soon that, that, because I've built my platform slowly. Yeah. I've not just, like these kids in Love Island, I've not just jumped in and I've got this overnight fame. I've kind of worked at it. Now I can understand people that it's all bullshit because we all struggle. So, and I'm not saying, listen, it's good. But who the fuck wants to be a billionaire in hundreds of millions? Because the level of sacrifice and no life that these people have, that's not the way I live in. Yeah. Because if you're putting food on the table for your family, you're winning. You're a winner. Yeah. You're a successful man or woman who, is, yeah. who you want well, to and be. And also, you know who... You- the genuine people around you are because let me tell you if you're a billionaire or if you're very famous hardly anyone around you is there for genuine reasons Mm. and i know that through my cancellation over over the past year you know the vast majority of people when you lose everything run away and so you realize who the genuine people are so for me obviously my family obviously my partner but then who is it well, it's the people who really know me. Mm-hmm. So the people who were at school with me, the people who were at university with me, you know, my my friends from my childhood, they were the ones who didn't care once I was cancelled because they know the real me. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're completely right. And I mean, again, this might be a cliche, but it is so true. And remember, I spent years and years and years covering all the biggest celebrities in the UK and the world. Mm-hmm. 
you know, the vast, vast majority of celebrities are deeply unhappy, quite twisted people. And I don't blame them in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, it's a twisted world. Mm -hmm. But yeah. It, Their heads are gone. Yeah. People in reality shows stuff and I, I, I'm, I'm friends with the majority of them because they seek help from me. I don't have all the answers. I can only speak because I don't drink, don't take drugs anymore. I'm on a good path. I understand life. But people need to stop buying into the fakery of social media because as long as you've got food on the table, your kids are healthy, your partner's healthy, yep. you're winning. Everybody <clears throat> defines success and levels of how much money they've got differently. But as long as you're getting up in the morning and doing something with a purpose and yep. putting food on the table, you're already winning. Now, you can go and achieve whatever you want in life, and I'm all for that. But just don't try and achieve what you think is going to fill yeah. the pieces because it's not it as real as it's made out to be. And that's where I get the good understanding of trying to promote a good message. And it's hard for me to say this shit as well because, I've, like I say, I've got a fucking Rolex on. I'm driving a Range Rover, but I just know that's not what wakes me up in the morning yeah. to go look what I'm doing in life. I don't really show off. I'm not, I, I do my own thing. I just love interviewing yeah. people, spending time with my family. Family's difficult as well. They're the ones who are always there no matter what happens, but it's still fucking hard to try and please everyone and do the right things. But just people need to realise it's not what it's made out to be. Your life's not inadequate or shit because somebody's getting a private plane to Dubai because it's all fake. Don't buy into that bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting with me because I've never been driven by money, ever. Money was just something that came, but I absolutely was driven by success. And obviously with the success that came in my world, the fame that came was more notoriety, if you know what I mean. I'd say I was more infamous than famous because I was reporting on other famous people. So it was never the money and the fame that drove me, but it was success. I wanted to be successful. And you're so right that Actually, and again, it's probably only over the last year that I've really understood this. Success is having a good family, having a supportive partner, being able to put food on the table. And yeah, maybe once a year getting to go on a lovely holiday mm -hmm. together. You know, that actually is success. Yeah. So I was chasing, I guess I was chasing the wrong type of success. But we do, because I create fame. I thought fame, I would have made it. I thought fame would have gave me, and I'm only at a very small way where I'm going to go in life. I'm very confident in where I'm going, but it's not where you're going to find your completion. It's not where you're going to get your answers. You'll soon realise that these people in that industry are so fucked in the head, you can't even have a conversation. The majority of them are coked up. The majority of them are suicidal. The majority <laughs> of them are just <laughs> pretending. Instead of being honest and going, yeah. you know what, this is all fucked up because yeah. every superstar out there, the Elvis movie, he was the most popular. He was the most popular man on the planet, but yet he was suicidal because he thought people yeah. would forget him. Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston. There's just something that's not normal. Yeah. Well, no, and also for every Taylor Swift, there is a One Direction, and if you look at One Direction, you know four out of the five members, and remember I covered them very closely at the time, are really unhappy because. They're never going to get that fame that they had. So, I mean, it's hard, especially for young people who, who become famous. But I do understand why people chase it and crave it, but it doesn't provide the solutions. Yeah. You'll see these 90s stars still trying to hang on and all try and get new groups together and yeah. boy bands. I do love and, that, though. And yeah, but that's what I'm saying. But there's <laughs> something in that yeah. that they must crave where... I know. Because if people are screaming outside your hotel and then that goes, they feel as if nobody cares anymore. Right. But that's just all part yeah. and parcel of that well, yeah, like when, when I was growing up, I would have done anything to be a member of Blue. Right? <laughs> I thought they were literally... And they still are. Don't I love. Wrong. I, I, I know a couple of the boys. Are, they're really good guys. No, no, they guys. Are. I thought Simon they were, Webb's good totally. guy. I thought they were the coolest guys on the planet, and they are. And I'm not taking that away from them. But I got to know them really well, right? When I was doing the showbiz circuit, and you know, they have been through the mill. Every single one of them. They've all been bankrupt. They've all lost it all. They have been betrayed by managers. They've been betrayed by the media. Uh, you know, it's. It's tough. That's what I'm saying. It, it's it's tough. So you should always follow. So for me, and I actually did do this, I never went into journalism 
because or broadcasting because I wanted to be famous. I went into it because I loved the pursuit of it. Um, and I, I just, that's what I encourage people to do. You know, don't try and become a makeup artist because you, you want to be an influencer, become a makeup artist because you really love makeup and then mm -hmm. let the other stuff build. You see these can. people on X Factor and that, and they say they love singing and love music. They can sing in a karaoke bar with the same passion. They're craving yep. something because they, they think again. Yep. And that's what the ma magazines and newspapers sell you. That's yep. a fucking wonderful life. But it's not my aunt. Well, no, and I mean that world, um, because again, you know, that was when I was at the height of my sort of, I guess, powers as a showbiz journalist was mm. around the X Factor, and I really got to know and like a lot of those contestants. But you speak to them now, and so many of them are totally damaged and traumatized by what happened to them, even though at the time. All they wanted was success on that show. And remember, they made a lot of money. But the problem is they were all promised an unrealistic dream. And yeah. as I say, for every Harry Styles, there's 10,000 who didn't make it and then have to go back and uh, do a day job. And that's really difficult. What was the first big story you'd done? Probably the first really big one was my first week at news of the world and i don't know if you remember there was a growing scandal about all of the tv big tv shows faking competitions and it actually became like a huge story and do you do you know james martin who hosts um saturday kitchen or he used to host saturday kitchen on the bbc so quite a famous chef and I'd got this tip off that the BBC, which is obviously really bad, was faking these competitions. So what they would do is they would pretend that the show was live, but still encourage people to ring in and into the competition and pay money, right, for a competition that they literally couldn't win because the show had been pre-recorded. But why I was so proud of it is the way that we basically totally rumbled him is that he had his watch on. And his watch had the wrong time on. So it proved that the show wasn't live, if you see what I mean. So I had to go outside James Martin's office. And I think he yelled at me. He swore at me. But that was like my first big scoop. And I'd sort of made it. Um, and that was in 2007. When does it consume you, though? from trying oh, to get that big story? For me, in the totally podcast, consumes you're you. trying to get the big guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes... When I remember hitting a thousand views, I remember hitting one thousand views, and it's the happiest I've ever been since being on this journey. Now we hit millions, and I think, ah, eh. so something must, know, the wires it's... must, something must happen. So yeah, it's all consuming, and it becomes quite addictive, and that is not a good thing. But obviously, if you're a journalist, there's something in you, and there's always been something in me. Like people would say, it's gossip, and of course, a lot of it is gossip. But I love telling people things. <laughs> Right. But that can be quite toxic too. So I loved breaking big stories. I do think though, and this is not to say that I've always been perfect in any way. And I have admitted when I got things wrong, but what I never ever set out to do is destroy anyone ever. You know, my sort of journalism was always about breaking good stories but usually with the cooperation of the people who you were working with, right? Because there's a real, I mean, this has changed obviously with social media, but before social media, you know, the Sun's Bazaar column and the News of the World showbiz column, I mean, they were the places yeah. to be if you wanted to sell an album. So there was sort of a quid, quid pro quo relationship going on. However, I would say over recent years, you know, I've learned that actually quite a lot of these celebrities who treated you like your best friend were doing it because they were probably terrified that you were going to write a negative story about them. But my goal was never to destroy celebrities, to bring celebrities down. That was never the goal. It was to write good stories about people. But actually, my favorite thing was interviewing people. You know, I love interviewing people and I loved trying to get big revelations out of celebrities you know and i interviewed all of the biggest stars many of the multiple times you know i was the first journalist who championed taylor swift in the uk for example when she was just a young 
country singer. So I got to know her and her family really well. You know, Rihanna back in the, the early days, Lady Gaga before she, she was famous, Katy Perry, you know. So for me, because I loved pop music so much, um, I guess I never, yeah, I always saw it as, yes, yeah, sometimes we would have to write difficult stories. But on the whole, these celebrities would want someone who could present their side of the story, but also promote their latest album or their yeah. latest movie. because they say no things such thing as bad press was as true to a degree but the negative stories do come at a cost now you've tasted it oh, now yeah. you understand it yeah. back then it's cut throat people don't really question it because people got every bit of information from the world from the newspapers oh yeah and there were certainly people who so if we're talking about regrets and remember, I was at this point a relatively small part of the system. I became much bigger as my career went on. But there's some I look back on and I was like, no, 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 we took it too far. One of them is a person who you know very well, Kerry Katona, and uh, Katie Price too, who I, who I know you've interviewed recently. And I knew both of those women. And clearly, in some ways, they're, they're flawed individuals, but they're also pretty nice people actually who were totally chewed up and spat out by fame and certainly there are times when i look back and i think oh god no we we took it too far with them but they were selling papers and um they they knew they needed that do you do you see what i mean yeah. so so because so i always preferred i guess my relationships with the a-list the sort of the A-list crowd because they didn't really need the newspapers and it was a different sort of relationship that you had, you know, if you're talking about, yeah. I don't know, Pink or Shania Twain or people like that, whereas Kerry and Katie, it was a different sort of world. They're, they're in the papers every day, those two still. Yeah. And it must be damaging to the mind. It must be struggling oh, totally. because the, do you think there comes a time when they just accept it as well because of who they are but there must come a time it must be de detrimental yeah, to the well, brain like, i was really good friends with nikki graham uh who was the big star of big brother in the uk and she was anorexic before she went on big brother and she died of anorexia not too long ago which was absolutely heartbreaking to me now you look at that and it's a really difficult one should nikki graham ever have been allowed to go on big brother as an anorexic maybe not but at the same time um would she have had all of these amazing experiences in her life if she didn't it's you know it's it's really really difficult um and obviously the one who i get the most criticism of which is entirely unfair is caroline caroline flack because I worked incredibly closely with her and was friendly with her and friends with her for years, for years and years and years and years. And I always had Caroline's back, always looked after her. She was a really vulnerable person, um, but a narrative, a, a completely untrue narrative around that has developed um, because of some stories that The Sun wrote about Caroline Flack that had absolutely nothing to do with me. Yeah, the media did push that girl over the edge, I think. But like I say, I know people, and she did struggle prior to that anyway. I don't know the ins and outs of her relationship. Well, yeah, the, well, the thing is, the thing is, though, it wasn't the me, like, so I was speaking to Caroline through all of that time, right? I've still got the messages between us in all of those weeks before she died. And Caroline had actually said to me, I want to do the interview with you. I want to talk about what had happened. She was being advised not to. The thing that pushed Caroline over the edge was the fact that the police decided to overrule the CPS and, and charged her. You know, she could have just got a caution. She should have just got a caution. And it was the trial by media. And it was also the fact that she lost her job on Love Island, on Love Island too. So... Yeah, a really untrue narrative has developed around Caroline and I, and that's really difficult for me because how 
how can you, you know, I know what the truth is. People close to her know what the truth is, but sometimes when a when a media narrative develops it can be impossible to change how is that when you lose people that you know from suicide oh it's the worst it's the absolute worst um i mean that was yeah that was an utterly devastating time uh but i was also friends with mike dalasitas who was the Love Island contestant who had committed uh, suicide or I don't think you meant to say that now, but you know, I, I don't do the PC thing, but had taken his own life um, a couple of weeks before Caroline. And I was actually at the funeral, at his funeral with Caroline. So that was, and spoke to her there. And then obviously just a couple of weeks, she was in the same spot. So yeah, it's. It, I think it posed big questions about reality TV. I'd always thought for a long time, because remember, like, there was that era of the X Factor where contestants would, and I mean, by the way, I loved the X Factor. It was my favorite show in the world. I loved it. I loved it when the judges were mean. I loved it. I can't deny that. I loved that show. But I always thought, God, what if one of these, you know, what if one of these contestants does something to themselves that could shut the whole thing down but of course it didn't shut down love island you know itv pushed on and it probably shouldn't i mean you can't ever blame someone else for taking their own life and i have experienced suicide in my personal world and it's a very devastating complicated thing where no one is to blame um so i think yeah i think it's it's really hard when these media narratives develop around it which are very often unfair yeah. but suicide is always going to be a touchy subject for people to yeah. speak about but people struggle and battling and decide to end that day it's probably a bigger strength to take your own life that's how, when you think about it, that people are, mm. would rather take their own life than actually speak about their problems because we're judged too much pride than we get judged of. Because bottom line is, for any person on this planet, nobody really fucking cares, Dan. Nobody no. genuinely really cares. You no. you felt it more so now when you realise, oh, wait a minute, it's yeah. different when you're working for all these big newspapers, you feel as if you're the big, I am. Hot shot. Yeah, yeah, you're interviewing the biggest names on the planet. Like, it must be a tasty thing of, because my job is to interview the biggest people, get the biggest story, because it feels good. Certain interview in a day, kind of exclusive in the UK, it kind of feels good of, okay, I must be doing something right, but then 10 minutes later, the fizzles. Who's next? And obviously, I'm not as dark totally. in that industry of trying to get that story, and, and it's very everybody's out for themselves. I always thought like the news of the world, the Sunday Mail, the Mirror, I thought everybody worked together, but it all seemed as if everybody was out to get each other. Yeah, I mean, there was lots of competition for big stories. But as I say, I did it differently because the news of the world had been in this big phone hacking scandal, right? Um, which happened before 2007. And actually, the royal editor of the news of the world, a guy called Clive Goodman actually went to jail for hacking into phones. Mm -hmm. So I joined the news of the world in 2007, which was at a completely different point where they had decided we're going to do things legitimately. And that was really good for me because I've been working for this, this newspaper called broadcast magazine, which was all about the TV industry. So I never used the dark arts of tabloid journalism, which had gone on, for about sort of 10 years or maybe even longer 20 years before that so they were like um private investigators and these things called blaggers which is when someone would like call up i mean stuff now you think oh my god i cannot believe that this is going on you know they'd call up and i don't know maybe your insurance company and they'd pretend to be you in order to get personal information and the hackers so that had all gone on right in fleet street but by the time i joined it had completely changed because no journalist is going to risk going to jail for a story right why are you going to do that the only thing that i would risk going to jail for and i've always said this is to protect a source so if i was ever in court 
and a judge told me to reveal a source of a story, I would go to jail if I had to. Because to me, that is the fundamental principle of journalism, that you protect your sources. And it was a disgrace that over the time of the phone hacking scandal, lots of these companies actually handed over their sources to the police. I just, I find that absolutely abhorrent. But that's a slight aside. The point that I was making is that when I came into this in 2007, it's like, if I break the law, I will go to jail, right? And when the news of the world shut in 2011, do you know, News UK, the company that was at the time, News International, handed over all of their staff's emails to the police. So lots of people were arrested. Lots of people ended up on trial. If I had done anything illegal, I would have been arrested. You know, the, the police were literally doing dawn raids of journalists' homes to arrest them. So the great thing was, I always knew I was completely clean. I did a different sort of journalism. I did like the old school journalism, which was all about talking to people, meeting people, offering people opportunities with payments. Do you know what I mean? I'm very honest about that. We did checkbook journalism. You know, Katie Price, you tell us about your new boyfriend. Here's a hundred thousand pounds. Do you know what I mean? That's what was going on. But I never tried to invade someone's privacy by breaking the law or like reading their emails or the phone hacking, hacking phone. stuff was crazy and gaza i had gaza on and i'm like i laugh oh, because amazing. i had gaza on and i laugh because it is fucked up remember he was drinking back then yes and he he loved the people who surrounded himself with but stories kept getting into the papers he ended up falling out with everyone around him, family members relationships the trust goes yep. and it turns out they were hacking the poor bastard's phone and that was the terrible thing about hacking. And obviously, like I've asked myself lots of times, don't get me wrong, what if I'd been there earlier? Right. And all of oh, you're the getting people, involved. Yeah, you're and getting all involved. of them. But 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 genuinely though, I wouldn't have. Because, because Princess you, Diana had the bodyguard on. Dan, they were getting one million pounds for an exclusive photo. I know, I know, but the thing is, right, you know as a journalist, right and wrong. Yeah. And reading someone's, that's cheating. Do you know, it, it, basically, it's the equivalent of a, a bodybuilder taking steroids to, mm -hmm. to win a competition. It's cheating. Where, where's the satisfaction in that? Journalism is all about using contacts or official means to get the true story. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're just hacking into someone's phone, yeah, you're getting the true story, but it's grim. So I, I look, I just know I would never have Did done Did you it. see the difference in celebrities? at the start of their journey to them when they make it. Oh, God, yeah. God, yeah. They all change. I mean, Taylor Swift is a great example of that, right? I mean, and can you blame her? Probably not. But she was just a truly, genuinely lovely human being. So I remember the first time we met, you know, her mum's there. She went down to Pinkberry and got us the frozen yogurts. And I'm literally in her hotel room and we're talking for hours. She's got the Grammys the next day. But she's not the big star of the Grammys at that point. Do you know what I mean? She's doing a duet with, with Miley Cyrus on stage. And every time I'd see her to begin with, she'd treat me like a friend. You know, she would call me a friend. Um, she'd actually say, hello, friend. You know, that's how that was her thing. And then by the last time I'd interviewed her, which was in Cologne, Germany, and this is around the time of, um, after 1989, but before Reputation, you could just see there was a big, big change and there was so much control. So I was there with a different crew from ITV News and Taylor's team actually took their tapes because they had control of the cameras and like edited out certain answers and gave them the tapes back. So they refused to, to run the interview. I wasn't doing an interview with her like that. I was um, working for the Lorraine show on ITV at the time I was the showbiz presenter. So we weren't trying to trick her out, but she was just different. She had changed. And obviously by that point, the Kanye West thing had happened and she turned on the media and she viewed the media as her Enemy. tormentors. Yeah, and so then I, 
I sort of fell out with her, um, which I think was a shame because no one had been more supportive of her in the UK right from the start. But again, it's one of those things now with hindsight, I look back on and I think, yeah, but she felt like all the media had turned on her. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? She couldn't see anything positive anymore about giving interviews or having these relationships with the media because she'd been so bad, badly burned by that experience with Kim and Kanye. I would say, though, Taylor knew how to give it out, too. Yeah. You know, she attacked her enemies she seems to be the time big, and again. The, the biggest name on the planet at the moment. Oh, she is. She is. And you know what? She deserves it because her music is good. And I, I think that's what it comes mm. down to in the end. I've always believed in that in pop. It's like if your music is good enough, you will prevail. How do they stay relevant? Do you see them when they hit a number one album or they're, yeah. they're super powerful and then it slips? Look, yeah, do you yeah, see yeah. that change oh, also yeah. when they go from the top to the bottom? And it's actually really sad to see. It's really sad to see because so many celebrities at the peak of their fame, right, they regret that they didn't make the most of it. And you see them years later and they're desperate. They're desperate to have the opportunities that they had at the time. But at the time, and One Direction is a great example of this, they were just under too much pressure to actually enjoy these incredible experiences they were having. And, you know, I felt like saying to them, guys, you should be enjoying this because you're never going to get this again. And believe me, you're going to want it. And of course, that's what happened. They go solo. There's only one big success story. That's Harry Styles. And the rest of them are going to spend the rest of their lives trying to achieve the success that they had in One Direction, and they'll probably never get it again. But there are a few genuine legends, I think, left, and they were always the people I was most interested in. And do you know what's interesting? They are always the ones who are the kindest. So clearly, I would see the likes of Little Mix, you know, who I adored and I knew them when they were little girls and then they become divas and nightmares. That happens, right? That's sort of the process. But the people who I had the biggest respect for were Paul McCartney, Dolly Parton, um, probably, I'd say, Rihanna too. Sort of the, 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 tr the, tr the true big stars know how to treat people right, know what they have to do in interviews. You know, they've got to give enough of themselves and they treat people well. Who's, but I guess it's easy for them to do that. Who's your worst interview? Do you know what? I, I do really like her now, but it was definitely Kim Kardashian uh, because <laughs> she just didn't give a damn. I, honestly, I've never seen anything like it. She had a blanket over her. She was on her Blackberry the whole time she was nearly like falling asleep um <laughs> yeah she but again i think she's learned a lot of lessons though over the years too because i don't think she would ever do that now actually i think she treats people with lots of lots mm. of respect but you know i love crazy celebrities do you know what i mean like i was on the road with like kanye west and mariah carey and justin bieber right all three of them now you can't say that the three of them are nice people, but I love them. I mean, total divas, absolute nightmares, but come on, isn't that what you want a celebrity to be? I mean, I don't want my celebrities to be down to earth. I mean, Mariah kept me waiting eight hours, but then she allowed me to like just be part of her entourage and just follow her around. I found it absolutely fascinating. Justin is like, um, the rudest little kid. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the most precocious, difficult nightmare of a guy. But of course, of course he is. You know, he, he's been in that world since he was really, really, really young. Kanye, clearly a genius, but really troubled. And I got to know him uh, just after his mum had died. So clearly that was like a really tough time for him. And actually, Brittany, too, you know, really, really lovely woman, um, but someone who has been so hit hard by fame and used by so many people. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think, look, you don't want your celebrities to be 
normal, do you? I mean, I don't. I, I found it fascinating. It. Yeah. And totally it, and for a journalist it's the perfect story yeah because it sells papers it makes you money it keeps you keeps everybody relevant if you're creating those stories but they, like i say those names it shows you how and you can't even know all the shit you went through you've still got to give credit for credit's due that those names are the biggest names in the world that's you at the peak of your power how was that feeling for you well i think for me i had i love music i love the world of celebrity i wanted to interview the biggest names in the world but for me it was about actually getting people to talk about things that they wouldn't talk about in normal interviews it's very much what you do you know i had my podcast when i was at the sun and it was my goal to get madonna on that podcast and i'd interviewed her previously um a couple of times and she's the most difficult interview you can ever have you know she's not I can't, you know, um, by the way, again, I love her, but she's not kind. She's terrifying. Do you know what I mean? She questions your questions and she's tough. But I built up the trust with her enough to have her on the podcast. And she talked really, really openly about difficult things in her life, being raped, um, about controversial subjects, like why she thinks Instagram is really evil. And... I don't want her to be easy. So, yeah, I mean, I would say I interviewed or got to know the biggest stars on the planet in a particular period of time, and that was amazing. I think we're losing a lot of stars now. There are not, not that many legends. You're not a star from... your People can be a bigger star on social media and TikTok than actually yeah. someone who's got a talent. Look at like your Freddie Mercury's and... Just people who you would, like, I would have loved to have interviewed Tim. I watched yeah. that movie and I thought, wow, that was fucking or unbelievable. Michael Jackson, too, Michael really. Jackson. I watched that. Was it We Are the World? I think on Netflix. Oh yes, yes, yes. And just yes. All, and for me, that was stars. That totally they were properly. Yeah. That's totally. who I see as celebrities: Stevie Wonder's, Ray Charles, yeah, yeah. Michael Jackson. Well, think uh, of who we've lost as well: Whitney Houston, Prince. You know, they are the true definition of stars. But of course, the star system has changed because, as you say now celebrities hold the power so i was there during the transition towards social media and i understand it i mean why if you were a young celebrity so ed sharon's a good example of this i mean again i got to know him very very well and i think he's a really decent normal person but by the end of the time that i was interviewing him because i was moving off to do politics and different things mm -hmm. he said to me dan why would any celebrity choose to be interviewed by a newspaper or magazine anymore because he's like even if you give me a fair interview what's going to happen and it's completely true still happens today is that there's going to be one line one quote buried within the interview you may have contextualized the quote but every media source in the world usually led by the mail online but followed by all the other websites is going to pull out that quote twist it put some sort of tabloid um, framing on it. And so I sort of understood where he was coming from because I would be writing, you know, the full 2000 word piece or having the 45 minute podcast or whatever, but, but the world now works in sound bites. So I understand. I mean, he does very few interviews. Adele, very, very few interviews. But you don't need to do them at that no. level. They're not craving anything. No. They're already multi-millionaires who, who have got too much money anyway. But they all, Adele seems, and it's the ones who don't but give they the most. Use social use. media, that yeah, way. that's what Ed Sheeran does. He only puts yeah. his music on social media, which is a good thing. How does it work then, Dan? So if you've got a story, Ed Sheeran, for instance, do you need to give it to the editor or someone higher up to then tick it off? Yeah, yeah. And how could why does human beings gravitate towards the negativity? Yeah. That one headline, because nobody wants to hear that I'm doing well and I'm no, staring no, no, no. Barbados. No. That why do we gravitate towards the shit headlines? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. Like, if you work at a place, and this happened when I was working at GB News, you know, they'll do market research and the audience will say, oh, we want to hear positive stories, right? You want to hear positive stories. You write a positive story, you do a positive show, you'll see the ratings or the viewing that, numbers plummet. Yep. You know, people are interested on the whole in, in negative news. But yeah, at newspapers, there's a whole system that creates the news. 
And that was something, I mean, when I got quite senior, by the end of my time, I could usually control it. But that is something that can be very frustrating as a journalist, because you can present your story in an accurate way, but then it goes through the sausage factory of the newspaper production process, which means you take your list into a conference when you're sitting around a table with about 15 executives. They decide whether they're interested in the story or not. They're listening to all of the different stories, you know, so you'll have the news editor who's doing the news of the day, the politics editor who's going through all the politics of the day, the sports editor doing the sports of the day. So they then decide which stories from each list they're interested in using and then what page of the paper they want it to appear on. But of course, during that process, what they also sometimes decide is what angle they want. So, so often, of course, with a story, it will be about the headline or the picture selection. And as the journalist, you're not necessarily in control of that. So that's something like I'm so excited about now with my new platform because it is completely independent. So what it's is your new be, platform for people to check it out? Yeah, so it's Dan Wharton Outspoken, uh, which is either at danwartonoutspoken.com or on YouTube as well. Uh, which is because I'm going to have a daily news and opinion show starting soon, but I'm putting up video content in the meantime. But it's the first time in my entire career where I don't have an editor who can potentially manipulate what I'm trying to say. So that's obviously really empowering, mm -hmm. also quite terrifying, Scary. yeah, because I don't have the big media lawyers who have my back. But, you know, Johnny Depp's a really interesting example of that because, you know, he ended up suing me and the son in the UK courts and Amber Heard gave evidence on our behalf. So that was the UK case. Now, we won that case, right? And then he won in, in the US when it was directly against Amber Heard. But the whole reason that court case happened was because of an online headline that called Johnny Depp a wife beater. Now, I had never written the words wife beater, ever. I'm not lying and saying that the column wasn't critical of Johnny Depp. It was. But I'd never called him a wife beater. So you can imagine my frustration around that, right? And that's what I mean by the newspaper sausage factory production process. Someone on what they call the back bench, it's newspaper terminology, right, in the UK for the person who writes the headlines and don't get me wrong these people at the sun they are geniuses like they're so clever like they come up with some of the best headlines in the world like megxit was created for my story at the sun by one of those genius people on the back bench so they're great but in that case they caused huge huge issues for me because it's on my story. Do you know what I mean? It's got my name on the story, but I never called Johnny Depp a wife beater. How is that then? Like you say, interviewing all these people because it, the last few years all kind of got messy. Like the Johnny Depp thing. Was that court case because of that headline? Was mm. that all through that headline? Yeah. So basically he, I think he wanted, I mean, look, loads of things had been written about him all around the world, but he chose my story to make his line in the sand. And I do believe it was because of the headline that called him a wife beater. Um, but as I say, the story was tough. And I've admitted my regret now in ever getting involved in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. And by the way, like that isn't me turning on Amber. It's really, really not. Um, because but Amber's your friend, isn't she? I wouldn't say she's a friend. I mean, I'd literally never met her, but obviously she then gave evidence in court on my behalf. So I got to know her. Our politics are completely different, right? We're on the other ends of the political spectrum. She's very woke. She's very lefty. But yeah, I liked her. I liked her. I got to know her. Really liked her. And I think she's had a really unfair time genuinely and i think we're all going to look back in 20 years time and think whoa we treated amber heard like we treated britney spears you know it's tough and how would people have felt if amber heard had 
committed suicide over the coverage that she received, you know? So but the sad reality is because of that court case and it was shown on TV, I don't think people would have been asked because it all went against her. I know. And the thing is, I didn't even know. It was 2011, they met. She was only 22 and he was 50. I only thought it was a couple of years mm-hmm. ago because of the court case that it was just kind of coming to a head then. Like she was... And I'm not sticking up for her taking sides because I love Johnny Depp. The guy did lose 40, 50 million, whatever it is. I don't know the ins and outs, but I did see a lot of stuff online and the court case. And it made it was a very toxic relationship. Yes. The both of them to the blame yes. to a certain degree, million percent from what I've seen. But she was only 22 yeah, and yeah. he was in his 50s. I think she was to go to an addition and he was the producer and they kind of met her and that's where the relationship stemmed yes, from. and it was that movie, um, God, what was it called? Something about rum. I saw it actually. And look, what my issue is, is that, and this was the bad side of me as a tabloid columnist, right? Is I chose to insert myself into that story completely unnecessarily. Like, why am I getting involved? I don't know what happened. I don't have any particular insight. I call it a carnival of commentary. You know, I got involved in that carnival of commentary. Loads of journalists did. But Johnny chose me as the line in the sand, as the person who he wanted to take to court. At the time, I thought that was a crazy decision, right? I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? All of your dirty laundry is going to be aired in court. And it was. And come on, that case was not good for either of them. The text messages were awful. It was just awful, the whole thing. But, and this is the big but, I have now seen how an ex can try and destroy you with completely untrue allegations just because they hate you so much, because they want to bring you down, because they cannot stand that you have had success after them. And it's just made me so much more wary about ever getting involved in something like that. I think it has to follow due process. You know, so so my view is, is that Amber had legal recourse. She had the option to go to the police. She didn't want to at the time. It should have been dealt with that way. Then the media should have backed off because there was nothing criminal against Johnny. We didn't. I didn't. My column was actually about J.K. Rowling, and that that gets lost in all of this. It It actually wasn't even about Johnny Depp. Basically, I was accusing J.K. Rowling of being a hypocrite because do you remember Johnny Depp was in the Fantastic Beasts franchise and J.K. Rowling had stood by Johnny Depp. But at the time, J.K. Rowling was big in the Me Too movement and saying we should believe all women. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe we should believe all women. I don't believe we should believe all men. It's like it's got to be case by case and it's got to be based on evidence and, and fact. But I was wrong on... I I was wrong to get involved. That's my point. I was wrong to get involved. It was very different to other stories that I'd reported on. So, for example, if you look at the other big stories I've been involved in, the controversial ones, Mm -hmm. which are like Meg Sis and Harry and Meghan or the Philip Schofield story, I I knew everything about those stories. I was involved in those stories. Do you know what I mean? I was talking to the people who were involved. I had actual journalism you know i revealed all of the big things about harry and megan and the royal family and schofield at this morning so that was different because i knew stuff that added to the story with johnny and amber i didn't know enough do do you see what i'm saying I, i i just made a judgment and i should not have got involved in it and i think johnny felt like And obviously at the time, I thought he was idiotic for doing this. And I wrote about it and his fans will never forgive me. They will never, ever forgive me, the Depp heads. But now I understand that he basically felt like this was the only way for him to clear his his name. Mm -hmm. And you can understand the depths that he went through, like you say. It didn't do anybody favours, but it did favour him most. He did lose Pirates of the Caribbean. I think Dior stood by him. Dior stood by him. You've got to appreciate that, but... But you, none of the studios did. None of the big colleagues get studios. rid of him. And how damaging that is to him, I think. He's six, yeah. in his 60s now, so... Well, and the same thing's happened to Gavin Spacey, yeah. right? So... He was cleared, was he not? Totally. Well, he's... He, uh, 
compared to Johnny, he's actually been cleared in America and the UK, right? Both sides. So he won both his cases and he's still being cancelled to this day. The big studios will not hire him. So the mission of my life now, James, is to try and, and some people call me a hypocrite, right? But I would argue actually because i know both sides i may be the best person to do this the mission of my life is to bring due process back to reporting we have to believe in innocent before proven guilty we have to allow both people to tell their sides of the story because i went through trial by social media and it was hell it was absolute hell and there is no due process in that whatsoever does that make you question the articles that you've written in the past to how people, what they actually went through with some of the yes. stuff that was written? Yeah, so that's why, for example, I issued the public apology to Johnny. Um, and that's why, for example, with people like Katie and Kerry, I would say, yeah, we, we went too far. But not on Harry and Meghan, not on Philip Schofield. You know, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for strong journalism. And actually, I think I was very, very moral as a journalist. It's really interesting, right? So, so when the whole world was coming down on me, right, and I was trending number one in the UK for, I think, three days in a row, and, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot. You know you're being the most talked about, most Googled person, and it's all bad. It's all bad. <laughs> there's nothing you know it's not, not for anything positive it's all bad but and i think this is pretty telling james right so so this was the opportunity for any celebrity who had an issue with me to speak out publicly like everyone was coming out against me right and only one did only one celebrity spoke out against me publicly and that was lily allen and we have a long history, right, Lily Allen and I. And I'd say we both gave as good as we got, to be honest. She was no shrinking violet. I think we were the same age. Do, do you know what I mean? And I actually loved her music, but she was really difficult. And we had a few public rows. And she called me out for a very nasty tweet that I'd sent. And it was really horrible, actually. It was when she was having, I think she had collapsed at Glastonbury after some sort of binge. And I wrote a horrible tweet. Right. But think of how many celebrities I've covered and interviewed over the years, like hundreds, and one spoke out against me publicly. So I'd like to think that that shows that on the whole, I tried to get things right. And even like with Katie and Kerry, for example, like I'm friends with them both today. I talk to them both. I've interviewed them both. Do, do you know what I mean? I think yeah. there's an understanding that mm -hmm. I didn't always get it right, but I wasn't trying to hurt you. I wasn't trying to damage you. I, I like you. Why was the Johnny Depp court case televised? In America? Yeah. So they just have different rules state by state. And obviously it was a disaster for Amber that it was televised because the UK case was not televised. So did Amber win the UK court case? Well, how, what was it? What, so, 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 so how was it? Because I know yeah. it's won one, but a lot of people well, don't know well, that. So this, is, so this is what the Depp fans basically say, that Johnny only won, because in the UK, and this is what people have missed, the UK case was actually Johnny Depp versus Dan Wooten and The Sun. Mm -hmm. In America, it was Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. But Amber Heard gave evidence on my behalf and the judge sided with her so in the uk it was a judge-led trial in the us it was a jury-led trial you know but if you speak to people in the us who i have huge respect for like my friend megan kelly who's like the top one of the top legal commentators mm -hmm. in the uk as well as being a brilliant broadcaster and you know her view is that johnny won that case fair and square but in the uk the judge came to a different decision yeah, that was a, that's a messy thing, and, and Amber did not look good in that at all. Everybody was siding for Johnny, and it, even for women, that stops women from coming actually forward. The majority of people don't come forward because of things like that can happen, and it stops actual victims from coming forward, and it shows that, listen, the majority of sexual crimes come from men, but the majority of false accusations come from women. Mm -hmm. So it's... I know, and the thing is, we cannot forget 
that there is a high number of false accusations. So, for example, we now have Keir Starmer, who's you know probably going to be the next Prime Minister of the UK. I call him Slippery Starmer. And he basically says, all women should be believed. You know, if an accusation is made against a member of parliament, they should lose their job immediately. How terrifying is that? You know, about one in 10 complaints about high profile celebrity investigations. So for example, in the UK, there was the Utri investigation, which was sparked after the Jimmy Savile case, which was a terrible cover up, right? He was like the most prolific paedophile in the country and was allowed to get away with it for decades, covered up by the BBC. So then there was a big investigation. Lots of other celebrities went down. Well, one in 10, the, the, the detective in charge of Utree said that one in 10 of uh, sexual assault allegations are untrue. I mean, that is a really high number. And so when people are going around saying, believe all women, that is really crazy. And I just ask people to think, especially people like Slippery Stum, how would you feel if some woman came out and claimed that you sexually assaulted her at university and you had to stand down and lose your job as, um, well, potentially Prime Minister of the UK? No, we have to allow due process to play out. So what I'm campaigning for is that you should not be named until you have been charged by the police. So that means that the police and the CPS, this is talking in a UK context, and I know it works differently in other parts of the world, but that means that the police and the CPS believe that there is pretty much like an over 50% chance that you could be found guilty of this crime. Before that, why on earth should, should you be named? Because what this is encouraging people to do is weaponize the justice system. And it happened with me. The allegations were completely untrue, but the police were pressured into an investigation. And then it's like, oh, the police are investigating. There must be something in it. No, no, the police investigate to see if there's anything in it. Yeah, men need more protection. Mm. Because I interviewed yes. a man just a few weeks ago called Brian Banks. He was an NFL rising star. Uh, and um, he never even slept with this girl. He met behind like a library or whatever it was. She accused him of rape. He went to... Um, so no evidence, no nothing, but he went to prison. And then the, his lawyer was telling him, look, just plead to it, no contest, you'll be out soon. The kid gets six years, lost his life. Six years he'd done in prison, lost his livelihood. His mother ended up homeless, sold her house and a car for lawyer fees. And then what happened is 12 years later, the girl admitted that she was lying. The girl got 1.5 million compensation as well. That guy only got 200 grand it's after 12 man. years. So men need more protection. But again, a majority of sexual crimes come from men and a lot of women are scared to speak out. So it's understandable. But for printing names and destroying yeah. lives beforehand, that needs well, to stop. Course, and, and remember, James, especially when you're talking about high profile people, because the difference is, right, if you're... I don't know, a builder or a lawyer or a, or something like that, probably you can keep doing your job if there's just an investigation into you. Obviously, it's different if you're a teacher or, or something like that. But if you're a high-profile person, you can work 20 years to build up your reputation and it can be destroyed in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. All you literally need is one tweet saying that you're being investigated for something People say there's no smoke without fire. And that lack of protection is despicable, given that we know, we know that loads of these allegations now are being made for political reasons or to destroy someone, specifically to destroy someone. And you know what's terrible is that it's, a, it's actually a crime to falsely report a, a sexual assault, but very rarely do those people end up in prison. Um, yeah. One who did was a guy called Carl Beach, who was a notorious paedophile, and he invented this whole fantasy around Operation Midland, where he claimed loads of high-profile political figures in the UK, including the former Prime Minister, had been molesting him. All completely made up. But the left-wing media in the UK, and this guy called James O'Brien, who works for the biggest radio station in the UK called LBC, just parroted it all. Um, Carl Beach is now in jail as a paedophile and one of my um, false accusers is being investigated now by the police. Uh, 
he actually has the most despicable track record, James. He went to jail in Scotland uh, for four years for extorting over £100,000 out of gay men, right? The judge described him as a compulsive danger to society. He gets out of jail. He then does exactly the same thing to me. Where's my protection there? And also what I'm thinking about most now is not me. What about the next person who he does this to? It's so disturbing. And he's not named. So how did all this start then? Like you say, probably the most dark times of your life when you'd done an interview with Lauren Fox. I think he said something about sh nobody would shag or something yeah. like that. Listen, you never, in your defence as well, and I'm trying to look at every angle, I understand that women might have been hurting. We're living in a day and age where you've got to be careful certain things that you've said. But you never really interacted with what he says. I think you had a little giggle, but why was this the start of cancel Dan Wooten was this the start was this the start yeah, of that it was, how did it work well it was sort of the end of it so so what happened there is there's a journalist in the UK she's like a I call her a leftist flamethrower she's called Av Ava Santina young beautiful woman uh seems to be very anti-men she had done a debate on the BBC basically belittling the idea that there should be a minister for men even though there's a minister for women and even though male suicide is one of the biggest crises facing us, right, as a Western society, not just in the UK, but all around the West, because men are under so much pressure and being attacked in so many ways. And she was really belittling about the idea of having a minister for men. So Lawrence Fox, you know, famous actor, very controversial figure. He comes on my show and says that he would never want to shag this woman. Now, as it turned out, I didn't know this at the time, but Ava Santina has used the word shag in a uh, pejorative way about men time and time again on social media. But she feigned absolute outrage and it turned into like this huge beat up of myself and GB News where I was presenting the number one show in prime time at the time. Now, what the issue was is that I was accused of not sort of taking down Lawrence enough. Do you know what I mean? So, 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 so the view was that I should have stepped in and said, Lawrence, you're completely disgusting for saying that. Apologize now. You know, that's what the broadcasting regulator in the UK called the off-communists who sort of control free speech on TV in the UK. Well, they're called off-com, but I call them the off-communists. Um, that's what they think I should have done. Now, actually what I did is I stopped Lawrence, looked through my iPad to try and provide some balance because someone in my ear had said I should try and provide some balance. So I read out Ava's tweet, which responded to this controversy. And then I said, but Lawrence, she's a very beautiful woman. So I thought I was doing the right thing, right? I mean, as we've discussed, I'm a gay man. Most of my best friends are women. I'm like the least misogynistic bloke in the world. <laughs> I, you know, I absolutely love women. Um, but Ofcom said that I had actually made it worse by describing her as beautiful. So basically, Lawrence is getting in trouble for saying that he didn't want to shag her. I'm getting in trouble for saying that she's beautiful. And we both effectively lost our jobs. I mean, he was suspended then sacked. I was suspended for months and months on air as this huge investigation went on. The whole thing was a chronic overreaction. I mean, Megan Kelly, who cause she appeared on my show each week as well. So she was waiting in the wings on Zoom, watching all of this whole thing. She couldn't believe it turned into what it turned into. And she said, I'm the first broadcaster in the world who was, who was cancelled for not being offended enough by something. And I thought about that. I'm like, oh my goodness, you're right. And what I never wanted to do, James, is be that person who just played devil's advocate for the sake of it, that. I hate that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't, I wanted viewers to know that I would be genuine. So like, I wasn't offended by what Lawrence said, right? I wasn't offended by it. So I wasn't going to speak out against it for the sake of it. Then anyway, turned into this massive scandal. Everyone's talking about it's leading the BBC. So I'm told, and this is probably what ended up finishing me off. I was told 
you've got to apologize. And again, Megan, who went through a very similar thing in America where she had to apologize for something she said as well, described it as the hostage video apology. So I basically issued this statement that wasn't written by me. You know, it's what you're, t so in this situation, you know, the crisis managers come in and they say, post this, this will save your job. You've got to do this. And at that point, I'd been through a lot because there'd been all of these false allegations made against me. I was not in a good place mentally, right, at all. I probably should have just taken a bit of time off, but I didn't. I pressed on. I went on and I did my show every night. And so I issue this apology on uh, X and... Lawrence, who I'd actually spoken to that morning, and I thought he was cool with it, but he hadn't seen the apology. So he reads the apology, thinks I'm throwing him under the bus. So he then throws me under the bus by posting a private message exchange that we had had, direct message exchange that we'd had on X, which made it look as if I was laughing about the whole thing. To be honest, I wasn't. I was talking to him about a previous segment of the show. It was just a stupid, you know, like I was on air. Lawrence had sent me a funny message. I sent him a quick message, but it made me look really bad. So then I was suspended. And look, Lawrence and I are fine, but I did think that was a terrible, terrible thing to do. I mean, as I said, I've told you during this interview, I would go to jail to protect one of my sources. Like if you were to ever come to me to reveal something or be the source of a story that would go to my grave with me that you were the source of that story no matter what happened down the track so the idea that i would ever post someone's messages to me publicly to try and damage them no i just wouldn't do that and you know for lawrence it's cost him a lot of friends actually and a lot of trust so lawrence and i are still friends but there's a lot of people who really liked Lawrence and had defended him a lot, who thought that was a step too far. But fundamentally, I don't actually think it was this incident, which is why it became such a big thing. It's because there had been this witch hunt against me going on for the eight weeks or 12 weeks prior to that. And all of the mainstream media were looking for a way to get rid of me effectively. Because just before all that happened as well, everybody knows with the Harry and Meghan thing, you're very outspoken. You broke the story of them leaving. Yes. How did you get that story? Because that was world headlines. Yeah. One of the biggest couple celebrity, well, celebrities, whatever you want to call them, but they're one of the most known couples on the planet. And yeah. And Americans love the yeah. royalties. They love Meghan and Harry, as far as I'm, oh. I know. But how did you? How did that? How did you get that information? Well, so basically, I had been working. I'd basically been breaking stories about Meghan and Harry since a few months after they got married. Because, you know, it became the biggest story in the world. But what was frustrating me is that all of this stuff was going on behind the scenes. So this huge fallout between Harry and Meghan and the rest of the royal family, including the late Queen, by the way. And no one was writing about it. Because there's this weird system in the UK called the Royal Rota, where the royal reporters are like officially sanctioned to cover the royal family. And I actually describe them more like stenographers or like PRs for the royal family. They don't really want to rock the boat because they're the people who, you know, if, um, I don't know, King Charles goes to a trip to India, the royal Rota, they're all on the plane. They go to all the events with him. They see him every day. So they don't really want to go against the narrative, right? And I'm a journalist that believes in exposing the truth, especially if the truth isn't being told. So I believed it was a story actually of constitutional significance, and it turned out to be that way, given they left the family in such dramatic circumstances or left the firm in such dramatic circumstances. But actually, the first story that I broke became quite famous. It was known as Tiara Gate, and it was basically about the fact that the late Queen and Meghan had had a big row over what tiara she was going to wear at the wedding. Now, there's been much said about this at the time, but uh, since the time, sorry, and Meghan and Harry have put their version of events, and, you know, there's disagreement about the exact details. 
But the fundamentals of the story were true, right? Which is that the late queen really didn't like Meghan and the way she was acting and had told Harry off about the way that she was acting. And within that story, I also revealed that Kate, or Catherine, the Princess of Wales, had had a fallout with Meghan. So this was the start. It was the first time. It was the first time any mainstream media outlet in the world had reported on any issues between Meghan and the royal family. Now, of course, we know things were actually a lot worse than that. You know, Prince William and Harry were physically going at each other in Kensington Palace. You know, it was bad. But it's really hard to be the first because it was all denied. You know, everyone said it was untrue. No, no, no. They all get on great. What are you talking about? Oh, this is just this, you know, tabloid hack, Dan Wooten making stuff up again. But I knew it was true, right? So I kept working on the story and I broke lots of stories over the months and months. And actually, people started realizing that I was the person with the balls to break the true stories. So I got more contacts, more royal contacts as I went on. And it culminated in Megxit. And I was actually on holiday in New Zealand. It was just after Christmas 2019. And I got a text message saying, you're not going to believe it. Um, they're leaving for good. And I worked on the story for about 10 days while I was on holiday in New Zealand. It was nerve wracking because they, and Harry has actually since revealed this in his book, where he described me as the sad little man. <laughs> That's and you mad. know, that's, I'm not little. That's mad that he's put you in his book, though. Well, yeah, because, because I mean, he really dislikes me. But um, can you understand why, though? I actually can't because I was not... None of this was about me disliking Harry or Meghan, right? I dislike them now, but none of my reporting was about disliking them. It was just the truth. It's like he's admitted all of these things happened in his book. Do, do you see what I mean? It's like he did fall out with everyone. He did fall out with William... They did want to leave the royal family. So I don't really understand it, to be honest, because the other thing is that I was talking to all of his team as well, who were briefing me and giving me information. Um, I didn't want to destroy them or anything like that. That was, that was not my goal. It's just this was a big story. I mean, a, 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 you know, fifth in line to the throne, the son of the queen, sorry, the son of the uh, now king, Quitting the royal family. I mean, it's a huge story. Totally legitimate. Completely in the public interest. And they wanted to scupper me breaking the story. So they wanted to announce it themselves. But luckily, I beat them to it. And it obviously became known as Megxit. And then all hell broke loose. Because, of course, we had uh, the Oprah interview. The claims that Meghan was suicidal. And the royal family didn't help her, which is just, I mean, it's bullshit. It's just yeah. bullshit. It's just not true. And the problem is they're compulsive liars, both, both of them. See, I, I love the idea because of Princess Diana. I, I, I actually loved her. I didn't know her, but I seen the way she operated the move. She seemed like a kind hearty person. I don't know her, but I always bought into the idea he was, I seen his mum and him. I seen, okay, he's trying to protect his missus and I could understand that. But then they says they want peace. But then I started questioning, well, wait a minute, you've done a Netflix documentary, you've written a book. Because he always seemed a good kid. When you see his mum and stuff, it must have been hard for the questions. Obviously, they'll know the answers, what happened to their mum. And people can go down the conspiracy route and question marks everywhere. And it's understandable the way it mm. happened. But Well, of course it is. I mean, Diana wrote a letter saying she was going to be killed in a car accident. I mean, look, I'm not saying that we should not be asking questions about the death of his mother, but the problem is that he sees everything through that prism. So he sees himself as a victim. Now, look, the way that he lost his mother was terrible, right? But... He is one of the most privileged men in the world, James. I mean, come on. He has wealth and opportunities that we or anyone listening to this could only dream of. So he went through a terrible thing. 
but he had an opportunity to do whatever he wanted to do real good. And for example, with the Invictus Games, it's very difficult to criticize that, isn't it? I mean, what a great initiative, you know, something for injured service people to give them hope. That's the point of the royal family. And instead, what he did is allow himself to be captured by this woman, Megan, who's not a nice character, you know, who's a very fame hungry. And, you know, because remember, I've done lots of reporting on Megan and what she was like before she was in the royal family. And, you know, she was trying to like, I mean, she was just desperate to date a British guy like she tried to date. Ashley Cole, uh, the footballer ex of Cheryl, tried to date Matt Cardle, the guy who won the X Factor, tried to date Max George, who was a member of The Wanted. She just wanted a famous British guy that, for, for whatever reason, she'd broken up with her husband. She wanted that. I mean, she hit the jackpot. Prince Harry. I mean, come on. And she never wanted it to work within the royal family. That was that was too hard for her. So they they concocted this narrative of like racism, and it's just not true. It's not true. They were given so much support. So I thought the story was really legitimate. And yes, now I am, I guess, on the side of the royal family when it comes to this. But I still think the royal family deserve scrutiny too and as a reporter i've broken lots of stories about william and catherine and prince andrew which is obviously mm -hmm. a big scandal too so i think the harry and Meghan thing was completely legitimate public interest journalism and i think the public had a right to know and i'm proud that i did it because no other journalist was telling the truth about what went on yeah, it takes guts but like i say i bought i like the fact of his mother trying to protect the family yeah. but then i did see the netflix documentary and it does raise question marks she is an actress again i don't know but but, but something but, but, but doesn't sit right. right so it's do you think she, he's so on you go on your go well i was just gonna say diana because i loved diana right growing up like young closeted gay guy she was like the ultimate i thought she, i think she i honestly think diana is princess diana the most incredible celebrity of my lifetime she's like a true icon like if you look back the last hundred years who do we have jfk martin luther king jr marilyn monroe and princess diana i honestly think she is at that level of celebrity and she did so much good she changed the royal family forever do you honestly think princess diana would want her youngest son literally going to war with prince william her eldest son who she adored and she knew was going to find it so hard to become the king she would be disgusted with what harry had done on that front and harry attacked Ka uh, catherine in the book and camilla it's like surely there's like there's got to be like because the problem is how can charles and william ever forgive him because they are trying to protect Camilla and Catherine. So he says he's trying to protect Meghan, right? Okay, fine. But then Harry is turning on their wives. Do you see what I mean? It's it's nasty. When did it all start turning? Is that a case of him being naive, her manipulating the situation and being an actress? Or has he got a part to play in it because it may be things that happened yeah. to his mum? Like, what's the whole outcome? Well, I mean, and that he was vulnerable, wasn't he? I mean, he was clearly a vulnerable guy sort of flapping around in life, not knowing which direction he was going to go in. And I think Megan massively took advantage of that. But at the end of the day, James, look, I know everyone has their own family issues, but to me, family is everything. Family is blood. You know, I stick by my family through everything. They stick by me through everything. And if you have an issue, you deal with it privately. So for him to publicly attack his father, his brother, his mother-in-law, his sister-in-law in the most brutal manner, well, they're not going to forgive him for that now. Once you've done that, you can't take it back. Do you see what I mean? Because he's saying racism was involved. Yeah. And then saying, oh, no, we didn't say that. It's like, no, 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 you literally did. 
you literally said that there was a royal racist who commented on the color of unborn Archie's skin. Which, by the way, I mean, like, my sister is um, in a relationship, her, her baby daddy's Samoan, right? So that's Pacific Island uh, country, different skin tone. Like, you are interested. You're just interested about what babies are going to look like. It's so not racist. And actually, here's the thing. William and Kate are really modern couple they're a really modern couple i mean actually they're quite woke on a lot of issues the idea that they are racist is ludicrous and what about charles and the queen like their absolute passion has been strengthening the commonwealth you know the the the, the late queen i'm not talking about camilla talking about queen elizabeth ii her absolute passion was the commonwealth right when you look at the commonwealth what are the most deprived areas of the commonwealth africa parts of the Caribbean, India. It's just ludicrous to suggest the royal family is racist. Now, the royal family is white. Yes. That actress from Bridgerton described it as terribly white or horribly white, whatever, on the day of the coronation. No, it's just white. They're a white family. We are a majority white country. I think 85% white. Here in Scotland, it's about... 95. 95% white. You know, that does not make them racist. They are not racist. But the royal family, it seems to be, I wouldn't say fizzling, but it seems to be messy they now with the Harry situation, mm -hmm. Catherine, as you, you say, but it doesn't seem to look good for the royal family. I'm trying family. to say Catherine. People, get, people tell me off for this, James, because I naturally call her Kate because that's what we knew yeah, her yeah, yeah. as. But people say now, you should be respectful. Mm -hmm. She's the future queen. She wants to be called Catherine, so I'm trying, but I've got to be respectful. But yeah, again, but I do fail. Things, it seems to be messy, and it's never the royal family always seem to, seem to have things under control. Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem so now, especially with books and Netflix documentaries. Yeah. Like, how who's given that the green light? I, mean, I always thought the royal family had the most powerful family in the world, or one of the most powerful family. Obviously, you've got families that people will never hear about, but. Why is it these stuff been given a green light and it makes it look weak? It's been, oh God, what it's been the worst 18 months, hasn't it, for the royal family? But the thing is, James, the late queen was probably, I would argue, this is at least my personal opinion, I'd say she's the greatest ever monarch. Certainly the greatest ever monarch in modern times. I mean, I could not, have imagined a world without the queen and so it was always going to be really difficult right the queen dying because you lose that connection to history there were very few people who remembered life before the late queen and on the whole in this country in the uk and around the world you know on the whole people like the monarchy i'm a big royalist doesn't mean that i don't think they should be scrutinized but i'm a big royalist so that was always going to be hard then you have massive scandal with Prince Andrew. You have massive scandal with Harry and Meghan. So lots is riding on Charles and William. Charles gets cancer. Badly. He's, he's waited his whole life for this. But he's in his late 70s. He's aged overnight. I mean, that's pretty heartbreaking. Because all of a sudden, his reign is completely derailed. And we don't know where that's going to go. We hope that he can recover, but we don't know where it's going to go. And then, of course, that heaps the pressure on William, who has to deal with all of the issues that Kate is going through medically. And William's thing, and remember, I've covered William very, very closely over many years. And some people judge him for this, but I think most people won't, is he puts his family first. And he's always said that he will put his family even before the crown. Now, who didn't do that? The late queen and Charles. They put the crown before their family. To, at, to what cost? Well, William knows the cost. So William knows, for example, that after Diana died, Charles just wasn't around much. He wasn't there to see him and Harry after school or... You know, because he, he was working all the time. They didn't have that close relationship. 
and and Charles did not have a close relationship with the late Queen because I mean she went on royal tours for months on end when the kids were young. So William wanted to do things differently. He wanted to be a modern dad. So for him, that meant that he was with the kids before they went to school and he's with the kids after school most days, which actually only provides quite a small window where he's fully working mm -hmm. as the Prince of Wales. That's controversial in, in some quarters, but he would say, no, his most important j job is to be a dad. He's obviously raising the future king, Prince George, but... All of a sudden, you've got Charles off the scene. Andrew can't work. Harry and Meghan are causing trouble in America. Kate's got her own health issues, so she's not appearing in public for three months. And William is starting to pull out of public engagements. That's a PR disaster. Yeah, because the editing of the photos, that why is that such a big thing? That's such a big thing because... The whole world wanted to know that Kate was okay. Because there's rumours that apparently she, was, she was, wasn't even alive. Yeah, which is obviously where ridiculous. Where does that come from? Totally ridiculous. The, but, but again, where this comes from now, and it's what we were talking about before, you can't control the internet. So, so if you just leave a big vacuum, right, mm -hmm. conspiracy theories are going to thrive. Now, by the way, I'm not someone who... Uh, a lot of conspiracy theories end up being true. So I'm not someone who... Auto, I mean, look at COVID. Virtually every conspiracy theory about COVID became true. This one's a bit different, though, because you're actually dealing with a vulnerable woman who's a good person, right? I don't think many people think Kate is not a good person who puts her country and her family first. She's asked for this time, James. She's going through difficult health issues. The problem with the photo is that it actually added to all of the rumors or the conspiracy theories, however you want to put it. Maybe I'll put it, call them rumors. It added to them rather than taking them away because lots of people do not believe that that photo was taken at the time that they say that it was taken. So I released those photos, who? And you can tell those fingers missing. There was... <laughs> just did it, it just look weird yeah. why was that on purpose to create more no. attention or, no, 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 so no. why would somebody not no. go through that with a magnifying well, glass it was, it was like amateur hour and this is what people don't realize right so so i'd reckon most people assume that the royal family have like an army of hundreds or thousands of staff working on these sorts of things now they do have hundreds and thousands of staff who work at like the palaces and Grounds do men, the grounds yeah, yeah. and all of that but actually they have a tiny team, like compared to politicians, they have a tiny team, like literally a handful of people who work on their PR and their communication strategy. Well, this, it made them look like rank amateurs. It was embarrassing. And sometimes the job of a courtier is to say, no, sorry, future king, you know, you can't release that. That's ridiculous. It looks photoshopped. Everyone's just going to, well, it was Photoshop. You know, Catherine's now admitted it was Photoshop. But I think what the problem is, is sometimes there's almost too much respect and deference to members of the royal family. Because, you know, like with a celebrity, an agent or a PR, sure, they can be sacked. So they do often bow down to the celebrity, but they're on the same level to a degree. Whereas the problem is if you're working for a member of the royal family, you know you have to call them sir and ma'am or Her Majesty, and I don't think that always works. You know, I sometimes think they need real people around them. And William and Kate used to have that. They used to have a really good team, and they've lost that team, and I think it, it showed. Yeah, because there's a big divide. People support Harry and Meghan. People support Catherine and mm -hmm. William. So there is a mass divide. No Young people, I think, think, support Harry and Meghan, but... Most, even in America now, even Americans don't like Harry and Meghan anymore. The How much show. pressure are on these women's heads though? Like, mm, so obviously nice. Harry and Will, you know, they've been brought up in that life. No mm. doubt they'll still be, it's hard to really explain to have that level of fame. And people look, millions, look, millions hit the streets when it's a wedding or a funeral. Yep. They've got so much support all around the world. People are devastated when a family member dies and 
But how much pressure are actually on these women's head? Even Megan, no matter what people say, like the pressure of not having a life anymore. Like how does that, it must affect them. Yeah, although my take on this is maybe going to be surprising because I actually think it's Harry and William who are most uncomfortable with their roles. I think they have ended up with two wives who in very different ways, right, actually really want to do these jobs. So Kate knew exactly what she was getting into. She was with William for years. You know, they even broke up at one point because William, he really wanted to almost like pressure test her. Like, are you really ready for this? Because he saw what his mum went through. He didn't want her to go through the same thing. And Megan, look, I mean, that's a woman who wants to be famous more than anything. I mean, more than anything. She has literally chucked every single person in her life under the bus other than her mum, right? So I know her dad really well. I know her sister really well. I think they're a really good, honest American family. But she was embarrassed by them. You know, she was embarrassed by them. They were too working class. They they were too normal for Megan. She She didn't want them to be part of it. So she just flicked them, got rid of them, embarrassed. So for me... I would actually say it is William and Harry who struggle most with the limelight and their wives in different ways carry them through it. William was a very reluctant king. He's taken more to his role now. And Harry just has so many issues. He can't cope with the fact that he's the spare, not the heir. He can't cope with what happened to his mum. So it's, yeah, it's really like, I think they struggle with it more. Honestly, I do. Mm. I think Kate and Megan, thank God in a way that they are keen for the limelight in a way. I'd say Megan's a lot more keen for it than, than, than what Kate because is. Though. There's so much stuff, like you say, with William and Harry and the, the, the women, King Charles being with cancer, but then Prince Andrew stuff. That Why was that interview allowed? That made him look oh. bad. Well, again, amateur hour again, right? Who, who gives Total a good light for that? Amateur hour. I spoke to someone who worked with the royal family and he says he actually thinks he's smarter than what it is where he can speak out and talk his way out of the situation. But it, it just but made it look bad. He couldn't. Yeah, why? I mean, who gives a green light for that? It was a total disaster. Well, he actually had this courtier who had been working for him forever, this woman called Amanda, and she thought this was going to be a great idea. I mean, that is the worst interview in history. Now, again, this might surprise you. I don't sign up anymore to a lot of the narrative around Prince Andrew. I was very um, negative about him for a long time. That interview was a disaster, right? A total disaster. But I've looked into things much more. This has nothing to do with my own experience. It was well before I had my own experience. I've spoken to a number of his close friends number of people um, who have really done huge research into what happened with Andrew and Epstein and his accusers, especially Virginia Dufre. And there is a growing sense that Andrew was set up and that while he may have been unwise to ever have a relationship with Epstein, I mean, what was he thinking? I mean, this guy's a paedophile. What was he thinking? That's unquestionable, right? But when it comes to the claims of Dufre, for example, they just don't stack up. They do not stack up. And it seems like very much um, she was driven by money. But the problem is, while all of the royal family believe him, so, so you know, like um, the late Queen and King Charles and even William, they actually support Andrew privately. They believe him publicly after that interview it became just impossible to imagine him coming back into the royal family and i mean what a disaster they actually need him at the moment but it's impossible yeah how can he come back you, because you like can't. you say just maybe he was just that party guy he loved the party naive yeah, stupid but again stupid guy it's the fact that Arrogant. epstein was a known pedophile he yeah. was charged he was convicted from yes. a maths teacher to this mysterious billionaire, yes. to then owning Epstein Island, one of the biggest yeah. paedophile rings where the flight logs have never been really yeah, yeah. out there but, in the open. But 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 um, why are they only talking about Prince Andrew? Though this is my point. Why are they not talking about Bill Clinton and Bill Gates, who were on that island far 
far more than Prince Andrew ever was. Stephen Hawking, mm. fucking old pervert. He was, and he was an Arabic. Now he used to go to strip joints. Everything. It's it's nuts yeah. to think that these. And the list is long, by the way. And listen. Same as when you look at the Jimmy Savile stuff, there's celebrities got photos with Jimmy Savile. Doesn't mean they're yep. paedophiles yep. either. The guy was a high profile name. Yep. You're just probably happy to get a photo with someone. Same as Epstein Island. Maybe people's went there once yes. and realised, wait a minute, this ain't right. But if you're going back multiple times like the Clintons, like other yep. high profile names, something's not right. No, exactly. And there should be equity and fairness around it. And remember, there's a growing feeling especially in America, that the radical left in America found it much, much easier to pin it all on Prince Andrew and Ghislaine Maxwell, Maxwell, both Brits, rather than having to target the likes of Clinton and Gates. Now, of course, I believe everyone should be subject to due process. But I mean, come on. Do we really think that Epstein committed suicide when he was meant to be on 24-hour watch in a isolation unit where it was impossible to commit suicide. I mean, there is a lot more to that story than meets the eye. So I think Andrew, to an extent, and don't get me wrong, and I don't want this to be taken out of context, I'm not defending him. He's made huge errors of judgment. But I think to some extent he was... He was the easy target, put it that way. He was the easy target. Yeah, because like you say, it's, it's the meeting of the Epstein, it's that, that interview. I don't think there's ever been evidence on being with kids. I no. think it's been the, the, the video about not sweating and it was at Pizza Express. Mm. It just, it I mean, just that was makes ludicrous. them look stupid. That, that was ludicrous. And but, people are going to then think, yeah. nah, what you're covering up. Yeah, but Virginia Dufresne has changed her story, remember, multiple times. Was one of the photos edited? Times. That photo was well, edited? Well, Lady Victoria Harvey, who's a, good friend of mine um really good person actually she'd be great great to come on here i think she's, i actually spoke to her a couple yeah of you, ago. you should she's fascinating i i i i i would tell her she should do it because i mean she is convinced you know she would bet her life on the fact that that photo is edited she's an ex of prince andrew she's still friends with him does she have skin in the game yes but as i say I've done a lot of my own research into this and it's not as straightforward. There's a lot of murky dealings involving Dufre, some of the other accusers. Remember, they've become very, very rich as a result of this. And who did they know was the person who they could most easily damage? Well, Prince Andrew. And one thing I do know for a fact, by the way, is the reason that Prince Andrew settled with Virginia Dufre, because do you remember there was that payout? And... The only reason he did that is because otherwise the court case was going to overshadow the platinum di- the, sorry the platinum jubilee of the queen. It was timed at the at around the same time, and and the queen she was dying at that point, and they all knew she was dying of blood cancer. So for Andrew to have pressed ahead with that, you know, everyone in the family was just saying, "Settle, settle, settle. Do this for your mother." Do, do you see what I mean? So the Epstein thing as well. Did you think Epstein had something over him? Well, he definitely had something over him, but but Andrew chose to go to New York to stay at his apartment, knowing that he was a convicted paedophile. That's wrong. Just to paint a little bit of context to it, though, loads of high-profile people were going around to Epstein's house. He was he was still the toast of New York society at that point. And not all men, by the way. I mean, Katie Couric, who was one of the top, you know, mainstream media journalists in the US. I've interviewed her for my podcast before, you know, host the Today Show, not involved at all in anything sexual, was at the dinner party with Prince Andrew. So it wasn't all to do with sex, if you if you see what I mean. But but Look, why did he go to that meeting? He claimed in the car crash Newsnight interview that he just sort of stood by his friends, but it was an odd one. So did he have something over Andrew? Possibly. Did Ghislaine? Possibly. But of course, she hasn't turned on Andrew even now. So 
maybe there was nothing to turn on him over. And as I say, I know, look, there's a lot of people who I respect hugely who are absolutely convinced that Prince Andrew is totally innocent of any crime, might be guilty of making some PR errors and doing a terrible interview. But personally, I think there is more to come on the Epstein story, both in terms of Andrew and Ghislaine, but also what else was covered up. What about the Jimmy Savile stuff? Why was that covered up by the BBC and how ruthless was he? I know people, you say, he just looks like a fucking creepy bastard, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. Again, people may argue he never had any convictions, but why was there such a massive cover-up with him? And why was, he, why was he allowed? And I think Johnny Rotten exposed him many, many years ago, but yeah. how dark was Jimmy Savile? Oh, I mean, the darkest. And I think it's the most shameful era of the BBC, but unfortunately the BBC has a big habit of this, you know, so it's meant to be the public broadcaster in the UK, but they contributed to the death of Princess Diana with that terrible Martin Bashir interview. I mean, I'm not saying the interview itself was terrible, but the circumstances of how he procured the interview um, was all about bribing effectively Princess Diana with lies. Oh, sorry, not bribing her, convincing her to do the interview based on lies. Bribing would be the wrong word because I guess she did make the decision to do it, but she made the decision to do it based on false information that he had presented to her. You've got, and that was covered up for two decades. And then you've got the biggest cover up of them all, which is the country's most prolific paedophile operating behind the scenes at your broadcaster and he dies, and then you cover it up again and don't allow your own journalists to tell the story of it. So I think the BBC is a very corrupt organisation, actually. I really, really do. And personally, I think it should be defunded. Um, again, that's not a common view. People always say, oh, but it's done so much good for Britain. No, it hasn't, you know. It's responsible for some of the biggest scandals in British history. Uh, obviously, there was also um, Alistair Campbell and, you know, the, the dodgy dossier and, and all of that. And I don't, I don't think it does any good for Britain, actually. For example, over the COVID pandemic, it was responsible for spreading fear propaganda on a daily basis. It's the home of fake news. Uh, yeah. I, and so I, I think, look, you look at those, all I'm saying, you look at those scandals, Savile being the main one, but no private organization would survive that. Just wouldn't survive it. Just like News of the World didn't survive the phone hacking scandal. Yet the BBC, we're still forced to pay this nearly £200 a year for something that we don't want to watch just because we want to watch another TV channel. I, I, I think yeah. it's absolutely outrageous. And I think the BBC is a corrupt organisation um, that's bad for Britain. But again, I know that maybe some people think that's an extreme view, but I, I, I don't believe it is. It certainly doesn't represent. So I, I think of my view as at GB News, the BBC did not represent them. It would attack them as being far right and racist and no, you can care about protecting the borders of your country without being far right and racist. So back to your own stuff. So you've you've had Lawrence Fox, you're suspended, mm -hmm. and then your accusations, the dark stuff, the was it people saying that you were sent asking for photos, you were catfishing, and then other accusations that when did is that because everything came out about you and then other people jumped on it or were these accusations no. on the pipeline? No, so basically the accusations were all funneled and I would argue created by one media organisation, a hard left blog. I'll name them if you want, but I'm also more than happy not to because part of me thinks they want the publicity. Do you know what I mean? They went on this witch hunt to gain this publicity. And this is an organization literally staffed by phone hackers. So it's quite a bizarre thing. 
And they were determined to destroy my rep reputation and bring me down. Now, the background to this is that in May 2023, my show on GB News, which ran from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. in prime time, overtook Nigel Farage, good friend of mine, but it overtook him as the number one show on the channel. So we were making real progress, right? GB News had like, it's sort of like, had started off as a bit of a laughing stock. It's like the worst launch on British TV, like, you know, none of the technology worked and it was, it was hard going. And then people tried to say, oh, you're the Fox News of the UK, which personally I actually never found offensive. I think Fox News is brilliant. But GB News became a big success story. And so they wanted to bring the people down who were making it a big success story. And this organization is on the hard left, right? An activist organization. They don't believe in reporting the truth. But what they did with me, which was so disturbing and made it so difficult to ever properly defend, is they, before they reported the story, they went to the Metropolitan Police with all of these false allegations against me in order for them to launch an investigation into me so that once they reported the story, my hands were completely tied because I knew that the police were looking into their allegations and it was all smoke and there was no fire, let me tell you, because believe me, James, if there had been any evidence of this, the police would have handed it to the CPS. The police did not even pass this case on. Not only was there no evidence, right? I was able to present corroborative counter evidence proving that I had been set up and that these claims were complete lies. So I've mentioned briefly earlier in the show, one of the people was a convicted extortionist. Um, another person was a convicted violent criminal who had just been released from prison. And I have recordings of him trying to extort me out of £100,000 in order to stop him going to the police. And the other was an ex-boyfriend with a massive axe to grind who had been trying to destroy me for five years. And so what my issue is, is that the process is now the punishment, right? Because I always knew that these were lies. And I said right from the start, this is a witch hunt. These are dark forces. But the problem is it didn't matter because the damage to my reputation was done. Because as soon as the mainstream media report, the Metropolitan Police have launched an investigation into accusations of sexual offences, well, you're done. You are done. How bad does that sound, right? Now, I have since been completely exonerated in two separate police investigations. So one was by the Metropolitan Police, one was by the Scottish Police. They never even handed the information on to the CPS. So that happened. And then um, I've also received two apologies from the two biggest newspaper, two biggest left-wing newspapers in the UK, The Guardian and The Daily Mirror, and they've paid me significant damages, right? But the original organization that pursued all of these lies with these false accusers, they are never going to stop. They are never going to stop until I am destroyed. What they did was not journalism. And, you know, I've admitted that some of my journalism, maybe I might not agree with it all looking back, Johnny Depp, for example, but never have I tried to destroy someone. Never have I gone to the police with false information from criminals to try and bring down one of my enemies. And honestly, some of the things they did were just so sick over that period. Like they, um, called the police to say that they thought I was going to kill myself. So the police did a welfare check because they wanted to be able to say if I ever did anything to myself that, oh, they were caring about my welfare. Like it was just 
you know, over that time I was hacked multiple times, like my TVs were hacked into, my emails were hacked into, all of my accounts were hacked into, like, these were dark and dirty people and it was grim. It was really grim, but but my big issue is that the process is the punishment because the problem is, you know, we haven't spoken about them, but I was the number one columnist for the Daily Mail, right, around the world. So I was the most read columnist, you know, Daily Mail website, absolutely massive, all around the world. And they suspended me the moment the allegations dropped. I wasn't even allowed to defend myself. No process whatsoever. Just dropped. And I was listening to your interview with Noel Clark. And I found it so powerful because he went through the exact same thing that I did, really. The accusations were made by people who were actuated by malice and who were purposefully trying to destroy my career. And actually very much like Noel too, who always viewed himself as an out outsider, right, in the acting industry. I was always a bit of an outsider in the world of journalism. So no one was really there for me. No one really stood up for me. No one really had had my back. How did um, that make you feel? I mean, it was the worst. It was the absolute worst time of my life because I knew what was being said was untrue, but I also knew this has become such a big story. This will stick with me now for the rest of my life. And the problem is when you become a political, political sort of figure. And by that point I was because, you know, GB news was a very political organization. I was considered on the right in this country, you know, that makes you a big target. And I was, I was constantly criticizing and pointing out hypocrisies right by the MSM and left wing politicians. So I was a real target and I just knew and this was the worst feeling. It's like, I know I'm going to be cleared, but this is going to be with me now for the rest of my life. Like, because people just want to believe it. And people didn't even really know what they would believe. Do, do you know what I mean? The allegations were so bizarre and so vague and there was no evidence of anything. But I honestly believe, and by the way, I'm never someone, like this whole interview when I've been talking about my career and stuff, I've never once ever said homophobia, right? I'm not, I, I don't like doing that. I don't like to make myself a victim because I'm not a victim, right? I have succeeded against the odds by not being a victim. So I've never viewed myself as a victim and I don't. But there was a huge amount of homophobia around this because look, I get it. People are quite grossed out by gay sex. Who wants, who, you know, no one really wants to read about what I was doing as a 25-year-old guy in the showbiz industry. Do, 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 you know, do you know what I mean? I'm now a 40-year-old man in a four-year monogamous relationship, right? Who gives a damn what I was doing when I was 25 years old in a very unhealthy, toxic relationship, as long as I was not breaking the law? I mean, who cares, really? But I know what they were doing. Right, They wanted to throw so much mud at me that just some of it stuck. And I believe this organization was really motivated by a relationship that they had with Prince Harry because this phone hacker had been giving evidence to support Prince Harry in his court case against the Daily Mirror. So when I say there were dark forces, it's not that I'm being paranoid. It's that I know those dark forces exist, right? Prince Harry wants to bring down his biggest enemies in the British media. Well, who are the two most high profile? Myself and Piers Morgan. And you know, he's moving on to Piers Morgan now. You know, they're mm -hmm. trying to get the Metropolitan Police. And I know Piers Morgan is a controversial guy, right? Personally, I really like him, but not everyone does. And that's fine. He's like me. He's like Marmite. People love him or hate him. He's always been good to me. And I like Piers. But Prince Harry is lobbying to get the Metropolitan Police to reopen investigation about Piers Morgan and phone hacking, right? From like 20 years ago. It's like, seriously, mate, go out in London. People are getting mugged every day. People are being stabbed. Like, you honestly think that's what the police should be investigating? There's already been an investigation and he was found innocent 
Or, or do you know what I mean? Nothing was, no charges were pressed. And you know, the worst thing that happens now, loads of people on the left are still saying, oh no, well, he, he wasn't cleared by, he wasn't cleared by the police. They, they just didn't find enough evidence. So it's like, okay, so there's no way for me to clear my name now. There's no way for me to do it, is there? Like, you're just going to believe it. And I don't really particularly want to put the evidence out there in public because it's embarrassing and it's personal, you know? Um, How's your partner handle that with accusations? Because it doesn't matter if you trust someone, it yeah. still raises alarm bells. Yeah, it's been hell for him. It's been absolute hell for him. And, you know, he is the greatest person in the world, in my view, because he has stood by me through all of this. And, you know, the thing about Alan, he's an incredibly loyal person. He's such a better person than me, you know, so I'm so lucky to have him. But I have strived to work on myself. Do you know what I mean? Over the past 10 years, like, if you come out of an abusive and toxic relationship, it really damages you, right? And my last relationship was so toxic and so abusive. I genuinely didn't think I was ever going to be able to love again. I mean, look at what this guy has done to me. I mean, this is a bad human, right? You can admit, no matter what went on, if you are still 11 years after you broke up, spending your entire life trying to destroy your ex-partner's life, like, you're a bad person, I would say. Um, so I took a... I worked on myself do you know I, I don't talk about this because i don't really feel the need but i was in deep therapy for example for years and years and years because i knew i had to get over this terrible relationship which damaged me so significantly and it was only after those years of therapy that i ended up being able to get into this relationship with Alan because I could trust him and I could love again and I could feel like I could be loyal and um, that I wasn't going to be cheated on. And did you know what I mean? All, all of those sorts of things. And I was just getting through that. You know, Alan and I had been together for three years and it was like my life had turned around. And that's when the ex decided to launch this campaign on, on Twitter. And I guess he achieved what he wanted. That's the terrible thing. Like, I know he'll be watching this. He watches everything. It's like a stalker. I just wish he'd leave me alone. You know, um, contacts everyone in my life. And I. the problem is I don't even like talking about it because I know this will now just encourage him to spread more lies. And the problem is what he can say whatever he wants and people are going to believe it because there are people who want to believe that I am a terrible person. But at the end of the day, this organization and the ex, all of their claims were based on me breaking the law, right? But they working together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who for, do you think behind? Do you think Prince Harry's behind it all? Or I, is it just a I sort of, uh, it, it's a possibility that just everything's happened at once? So I don't think he's behind anything to do with the ex. That was a completely different thing. Yeah, that seems a bit extreme. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you so, think the ex has just jumped on something yeah. that's came out about you? Well, it's more that, the, so basically the ex had been trying to sell this story or put the story around about me for like five years and no mainstream media organization would touch it, right? Because there's no evidence. So he'd been to every newspaper, every broadcaster, none of them would touch it because what he's saying is not true. And if you're a journalist, you've got to prove truth. Like surely there would be an email or there would be some evidence or, you know, there's nothing. He has nothing. And, but, but it was this organization who ended up publishing it is the organization that is working with Prince Harry. So they have a motivation to run these lies about me in a way that other media organizations would not do. But the thing that's so disturbing for me is what this means for other people. Because I know that the police can now be weaponized in this country. There's a two-tier justice system, right? So, for example, if you make a complaint about an MP or a high-profile TV presenter or a top podcast or a big celebrity, the police are going to take these allegations far, far more seriously than if you were making the allegation against a, a member of the public who didn't have a profile. 
And that's because the police have been so burned by stories like Jimmy Savile, right? But the problem is there has to be some sort of happy medium here because I can tell you in my case, this was literally just a smear campaign. And it was a smear campaign based on sex, right? But there was absolutely nothing illegal. Absolutely nothing illegal. And no evidence of anything illegal. And as I say, I it's such a tough one in this because I would love to just be able to tell you like, and I would sit down with anyone privately and literally show you emails, show you videos, like I've got it all. But I hate talking about it because what it does is it reinforces the false allegations that were made. And that's something we used to talk about on GB News, actually, because, for example, with Kevin Spacey, he was cleared, but then you'd watch the news report and it would say he was cleared of molesting or you know i'm not going to say what it was because i'm then doing the same thing but you just so, so even being cleared you're reinforcing what the negative stories are which people then believe mm -hmm. do you see what i mean yeah. so this was all about a, a, a smear campaign and it worked it worked because for whatever reason like you can say oh well maybe it was the lawrence fox thing but i think really the reason i lost my two massive, because, you know, I was a success professionally, you know, which is ironic because that's what I've been wanting to achieve, but, and it still didn't protect me, but I was a success professionally. I had the top rated show on GB News and I had the number one um, most read column on the mail website. So, and it still didn't protect me. So the smear campaign worked. Um, weirdly, there's something quite freeing about all of this, though, too, because, I mean, I look at what you're doing, for example, and it's an inspiration to me, I guess, looking at the media, Tucker Carlson, Megyn Kelly, you know, there's, in the UK space, there are not that many people going independent in the news space, and this is where things are heading but the bigger thing is is i just don't want to be able to be cancelled again on lies and i think the only way i can do that is not to be reliant on money from billionaires or big corporates because they're so nervous now like you know people get sacked because you know 50 tweets get sent about something for example do, do you see what I mean? like people yeah. just they overreact same as look at um Who's a little comedian? He was supposed to, he was supposed to host the Oscars, but he done a tweet like fifteen years ago oh, yeah. that he'd already apologised yeah. for, and he says it wasn't apologised again. I think yeah. apologies as well. People need to stop saying sorry as much. Well, I know because as soon as you say sorry, you're admitting something where we're living in a fragile world. Bottom yeah. line is, people can be who they want to be, say what they want. 100%. How was it when GB News never had your back? Apparently, a free speech platform. Yeah, I mean. It was gutting, and I have to say, you're so right. So probably my two biggest mistakes during all of this were my two apologies, right? Because the apology over Lawrence Fox completely backfired. I didn't mean it, right? I didn't mean it. I said it to try and save my job, and it didn't. So I was wrong. I shouldn't have said something that I didn't believe, which is why I didn't apologize on the show. And then the other thing that I'd had to do, and again, this is what, GB News had wanted me to do so I'd done it because you know I wanted to keep my job and I didn't want to keep my job by the way and I'll be really clear on this because of money wasn't anything to do with that I was desperate to keep my job because I had created this amazing community who were watching my show every night we were like a little family we'd become the number one show I knew we were going to start making a difference and that's why they wanted to take me down you see I'd given a voice to lots of people who had never had a voice in the mainstream media before. So I really believed in what I was doing on GB News. Do you see what I mean? It wasn't about, oh, I just don't want to lose my job. It was because I put everything into creating this platform and turning it into a success. So, so, so that was that. But then GB News had said, oh, well, you need to, because there's all of these claims out there about, you you need to go on and express like 
some contrition and be humble and, you know, and sort of admit that you've been wrong on things in the past. And it's like, again, I was in such, honestly, it's when you're in a situation like that. And again, I was listening to what Noel said to you, you're not thinking straight. You're in total crisis mode. You, you can barely put one foot in front of the other. So I was like, okay, that's what they want me to do. So I went on air and I did a monologue basically saying, of course, I've done things in my past that I regret. Who hasn't? Do you really want to cancel me for these things 15 years later? But I spoke to Douglas Murray later. He's a brilliant, um, brilliant columnist, you know, really great guy. And he said, you should never have done that because it looked as if you were saying that you'd done something wrong. And actually, your private life is your private life. Your sex life in the past is, is your sex life. So it was, again, probably a mistake because what it did is it made it look as if, well, there must be something to these mm -hmm. allegations. And actually, there was a fundamental question here. Had I broken the law? And no, I had not. And so anything else, really, why, why is it of any relevance 15 mm -hmm. years on? Well, that's know? the power of being backed into a corner. People yeah. try and speak their way to it. And it just raises more questions. Bottom line is, if it's your private life, nobody needs to fucking know. No. Whatever happens there, like you say, if you've broke the law, of course, law needs to be, if it's there, then justice needs to be served and people need to go to court. But it's a fair trial and then things can go out the open. Yes. But your stuff wasn't even, you weren't even charged. And then February no. come, you get the old clear. How was that feeling for you? Yeah, I mean, one of the best. One of the best. Were you still actually. nervous though? Because the mind can play tricks oh. and you think... I'm going to get fucked. I'm going to get charged. I might go to prison. I've lost yeah. everything anyway. I'm going to lose my partner. I, I mean, then you have nothing. Seriously, James, I was like, look, the problem for me is I don't trust the establishment in this country. I do not trust them. I think they were out to get me. And I do not trust the Metropolitan Police. So look, some people will say, yeah, but they, they didn't charge you they didn't pass it on to the cps so so you should have trusted them because they made the right decision but james they should never have even investigated there was nothing to investigate and you know the worst thing that they did after the lawrence fox story was the number one story in the country they released a statement saying that they were investigating me now that's actually against the law there's a supreme court case versus Bloomberg, the business outlet, and an unnamed man who was a big business guy who took Bloomberg to the Supreme Court to say he had a right to privacy before he was charged. And that was agreed to by the Supreme Court. So why was the Metropolitan Police releasing a statement about me being investigated for something that Lawrence Fox said on my show. Do you see what I mean? And what it was, and this is what happens. Honestly, I know what it's like now when the whole establishment turns on you. The mainstream media, the police, they are all coming for you. And that the mail sacked me the same week. So it was like I had, you know, the media were camped outside my house. I couldn't leave my house. Couldn't even get to see my psychiatrist who was helping me through a really difficult time because I literally had the media outside. You know, everyone turned. So the problem is, then I thought, God, maybe, even though I know that I have the evidence and everything, maybe, maybe they're just out to get me. Like, because they shouldn't even be investigating this. They shouldn't have announced the decision. So when I finally got through the process, I was absolutely delighted. But that's six months of my life. You know, six months of my life when I was silenced. You know, I try and contribute now to the news of this country and provide my viewers with the voice that they don't get in the mainstream media. And for that whole time, I was silenced. And... You know, I, it was, it, look, it was the true definition of being cancelled. I now know what it's like. I mean, I actually had a segment on my show every single night called Uncancelled because I so believed in providing people an opportunity to come back. And so, obviously, there was a real irony to me that GB News then effectively did 
the same thing to me. It was hard. And also it was hard because I thought they owed me loyalty. But I'm not bitter because I had an incredible time there. And I really believed in the purpose of the station and still do. But I also now believe that probably the only place that I can survive and thrive is in the independent media. Because the problem is, at GB News, there was an advertising boycott, right? So they're constantly having to try and appeal to the woke advertising agencies. So like when the whole thing with Lawrence Fox happened, apparently they lost one of their main advertisers. So probably they were having to say to their advertiser, oh, don't worry, None of them are coming back. Do, do you see what I mean? It's very it's corrupt. Money. It's yeah, all money. It is. Well, it's Tucker. All... Tucker spoke about that. Big yeah. Pharma in America, you know, it's fund all money. of the yeah. channels. So if they they'll get they'll throw anybody under the bus to keep their sponsorships. Everything's to do with money. Being independent. Who the fuck do you bow down to? No one. Yeah. You don't obviously want to say what you want to be this controversial guy who's causing shit to be controversial no. for the sake of it. Try and be as authentic and as yeah. and, and honest as you can be. Like I say, my platform is only for the guests to tell it from their side. Yeah. Don't judge or don't challenge because it's their story. Yeah. Yes, there's three stories, like, three sides to the story like we spoke about, mm. but it is what it is. So yeah. when you got cleared, how was that feeling? Was that an emotional day? God, yeah. God, yeah. Because the thing is, honestly, it's freedom right the, the, like what do we all crave i've realized it's freedom and often that's why people i think are motivated by money because they believe that money equals freedom and to an extent you can understand yeah. that because if you can stop working or live overseas or go on holiday it's a degree of freedom but when i was caught in this horrible investigation sort of no man's land you have no freedom because you have no control over where your life's going. And I never really want other people to have that control over me again, really. And I mean, look, the problem is, though, there's nothing to celebrate when you're cleared because you're financially devastated, you're reputationally devastated. And so the enemies win. And that's why I think there has to be a higher bar to all of these things. And with me, there wasn't, you know, I'm sorry when you've got two career criminals and a fantasist making ludicrous claims without any evidence, I would argue the whole thing was a total waste of police time. And that makes me angry too. And there were some really nice people actually within the police but on the whole, I mean, they operate in a sort of catastrophic way, you know, losing evidence all the time, having to go back to the start. It's like, it's like all of our big institutions in this country are breaking down. The police, the NHS, HMRC, nothing's working properly. And I'm like, why are you wasting time investigating what is a political hit job? This was a political hit job and nothing more. So yeah, it was incredible to have that sense of freedom back. And don't get me wrong, like all of a sudden you feel a little bit uncancelled. You're like, okay, maybe there's some hope. But do you know the thing that's just been incredible is um, my audience. They literally stood by me. So my colleagues didn't stand by me. A lot of my friends didn't stand by me. But my audience were absolutely rock solid, resolute. They never wavered. And the thing is, I think compared to most presenters, I had a really personal connection with my audience because I built something from scratch. I mean, it must be like you. I built something from scratch. Sure, I didn't own it. It was in the mainstream media, but GB News didn't exist before I started. You know, I hosted the first ever show on GB News, the first ever regularly scheduled show. So I felt like we had a connection from the start and I would speak to my audience every night um, via like a club that we had on X. I'd message them personally. Do, do you know what I mean? It wasn't I, I, because I never took them for granted. I, I knew that I needed their support and they meant a lot to me. And they never wavered through the whole thing. They understood it was a witch hunt. 
They trusted me. They literally sent thousands and thousands of letters to GB News. And then when I launched my new outspoken platform, I, I mean, I've been o overwhelmed. Like, um, So I'm hosting on Substack as well as YouTube. And, you know, Substack have said, this is one of our fastest growing Substacks ever in the UK. So they got me through, actually. And what I just realized is that I don't want to be part of this MSM anymore because the, the, none of those people were there for me. None of them. But that's fizzling out. And no, you need to get it out of your head as well. Nobody can be cancelled now, especially with yeah. social media, especially yeah. with Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Rumble, whatever it is. You can't be cancelled. Yes, you might need to start afresh again. Yeah. But it's starting from the bottom where you've already got your contacts. You're not starting from 20 years ago, especially with the contacts you've built up. You're starting... Yes, maybe a new platform, but you're starting with the 20 years of knowledge yeah. and understanding what you've got it. So you can take it wherever you want it. People watch GB News for you, not because it's GB News, because you built your yeah. own platform, you'd built your own your audience, like you yeah. said. So you've got the, nobody gets cancelled. And I've spoke to people and I say, listen, you only cancel yourself because you become defeated in here. Yes, it was fucked up. And you get these charges and accusations or whatever people get and they get cleared Yes, it's hard to pull it back, but it can be pulled back yeah. because everybody's looking at your Russell Brands and whether it's Andrew Tate's, Katie Hopkins, Tommy Robinson, whatever. Yeah. People's opinion of these people are, they're cancelled for a reason. People get cancelled mm. if, if they've ruffled the feathers and a lot yeah. of people are backing the ones who are getting cancelled now, no matter the accusations. Well, I would argue all of the people who you've just mentioned are actually more powerful now than they ever have been. And people would judge me for this, but you know, I've had communication with all of those people. You know, I had Andrew on my show. I know you've interviewed yeah, yeah. him numerous times. I've interviewed every one of them. Yeah. And I think, um, I think Andrew and his brother, Tristan have been subjected to a despicable witch hunt actually. And again, I know that's not a view that everyone will share, but I've looked at the evidence and that is my yeah, personal same. There's view. nothing for them. And Romain, it looks as if, the UK are trying to reopen something from 2012. Yes, but that's what I mean. There's there's the weaponization again. So, you know, and this is the problem. Are you ever free or are the Met Police at some point, I'm going to say something controversial again, and then they reopen an investigation. You know, it's ludicrous. But I'm very inspired by that. But I'm also, I think, because for me, I guess I'm more in the news space. I still really believe in that, 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 I want my platform to be very reactive. You know, it's going to be about the day's news, um, but in an honest way. And I'm what I'm really inspired by is seeing in America now, um, the folk who've left Fox News are actually more influential in the independent space. So like there's there's so many now. There's like obviously Megan Tucker, who are incredible, but there's George also... George Hawkins got a massive platform. Oh, yeah. He's, I mean, he's the ultimate, isn't he? Mm -hmm. But there's Dan Bongino on Rumble, who is doing crazy numbers. He was so supportive of me. He said, um, GB News folded quicker than a cheap suit. And he's like, you were better out of it. There's Dave Rubin. There's Bill O'Reilly. There's Glenn Beck. And I listened to all of them. I love them. And what I kept thinking is I'm like, well, there's no one in the UK who's doing this because there's people like you who are doing amazing in-depth interviews. There's people like Russell who are doing incredible analysis, but mainly of like American politics, but there's no one who's taking the news of the day yeah, none. and doing a show. But when do you become a target like me? I just didn't. A few people, yes, it can be controversial because it comes to a lot of people come here for a fair interview, but when do you become a target? Because you look at people who have... Like, Russell was always going to come a target, let's be honest, because he was... Well, he's challenging going, the narrative. Yeah, he was going right out against it. And people know now, once you go that far, there's no coming back. Andrew Tate says that, listen, they'll cancel you. Prison, number three, three strikes. Prison, mm -hmm. cancelled, dead. Well, look at what they're doing to Lawrence Fox mm -hmm. as well. I mean, and... I'm, Why was the police in his house oh, a couple of days after that? Well, exactly. Again, the whole... I mean... Look, they claimed it was because Lawrence had said something about ULES cameras and wanting to cut down, you know, Sadiq Khan's despicable mm -hmm. ULES cameras. But I'll tell you what that was. It was the whole establishment turning on Lawrence. So they both did, they did it to both of us. All of a sudden, we're number one story in the news for nothing. Come on, that conversation, that, that mm -hmm. didn't deserve to be the number one conversation in the news. And then all of a sudden, 
both of us have the police in our lives. I mean, that's deep state stuff. And people say it's a conspiracy theory when you talk about the deep state. No, it's the reality. The UK has a deep state. It has a swamp. And Liz Truss, who I'm a big fan of, has just pointed it, pointed it out too. Now, she was cancelled in a very different way. She was challenging the narrative in a different way. She was challenging the globalist narrative and the financial narrative. So I agree. And I would not be surprised for Andrew and Russell and Lawrence for at least them to try and get them into prison. But I have more trust and more faith in the British public, actually. And I think hope and I pray that they will see that all of these things are terrible witch hunts too. But but he is right. It's terrifying. And this is something I keep on saying that the justice system is now being weaponized for political reasons and they try and shut down dissident voices, right? Because all of those people you've mentioned are different. They're all different. They all have their own shtick. They focus on different things. I mean, look at Tommy and the grooming gangs, Russell with the World Economic Forum and the COVID vaccines. You know, they all have different focuses, but what they are all doing is challenging the mainstream narrative. Now, I would say I find it quite hilarious that that I've been cancelled because, you know, a few years ago, I would have been considered a centrist. You know, I don't think I'm at all extreme. I think I just represent the views of the vast majority of the British public. And we're now being called far right I mean, that is nuts. It's completely nuts. It's like, I believe in sovereignty. I believe in low taxes. I believe in protecting our borders. I just honestly believe that they are shared by the vast majority of the British people. But the UK is on its ass. If we're honest, it's on its ass. The well, tax, it's only going to get worse. The tax, the weather, everything that's just, it just doesn't seem right. It's just, even when I'm in London, it doesn't feel right. No, 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 it doesn't feel safe. And it's I don't even wear a watch down there. It's just, you can't be. Sadiq Khan it's just weird place. has literally destroyed what was the greatest city in the world. So I love I London and I'm a Scotsman. I yeah, love yeah. London. I always dreamed of yeah. moving there, doing things there. I don't know. I, I question maybe the novelty wore off, but it's just a, it's a sicky feeling there. It's Something's totally not different. Right. It's totally different. It is no longer a safe place. There are no-go zones. Again, something you're not meant to say. But believe me, if you're white, or specifically if you're Jewish at the moment, there are no-go zones in our capital city. And we're all just meant to accept this. I mean, Sadiq Khan is a dangerous person. Look at what happened to Lee Anderson. He lost his job in the Conservative Party uh, for, I think, making completely... Uh, true comments about Sadiq Khan. So I think we are in a really tough place as a country. I'd argue that, and I'm not sure of your view on her, but I'll I'll, I'll go there. You know, Scheming Sturgeon has, um, you know, during her time in office completely uh, destroyed Scotland too. I love Scotland. You know, my boyfriend's Scottish. Mm -hmm. I love being here, but she has done a terrible, terrible job. And again, I won't talk about it for contempt reasons, but let's see. What happens in terms of that police investigation too? Something that the media didn't want to report for months and months and years and years. So there's a, and again, I'll move on from Sturgeon because I don't want to end up in yeah, jail but listen, for man, contempt. But you know, the but there's a lot of corruption the, yeah, as well. The I'm laws saying. here and the, the bullshit, like there was some kid who graped a woman and then they were feeling, they were talking about f having sympathy for his feelings and it was it was weird and people getting community service like the laws and that here in Scotland's one it's ass as well. Well, Isla Bryson, I don't, it's just who, weird. Who's Adam Graham, a male rapist, mm -hmm. who Sturgeon was going to send to a female, female prison. prison. He's standing outside in court with a skirt on. His pecker coming through his gut. Yeah, and uh, for me, that's that's not that, that that's not who no. should be leading your country. No. That's not who should be leading. Full stop. No. But be, thank Thank God for the uncancelables, though, because someone who we haven't mentioned, I guess, because she's so different to all of the other people you've mentioned, because actually she is on the political left. But what about the bravery of J.K. Rowling? You know, someone who I fell out with over the whole Johnny Depp situation, but she's actually become one of my heroes because this is someone who literally said, I do not care about my reputation because what I care about is protecting the rights of biological women, standing up for reality and 
I compare her to scheming Sturgeon, I think, my God, I know who I'd rather have uh, running the country. So, so I think there is some hope. And one of the real reasons for hope is you're right. You can't be cancelled now. Like if this had happened to me five years ago, James, seriously, like what would I have done? Seriously, like no one's going to hire me, right? It's terrifying. So I am blessed actually that technology and um, the way that we consume the news and the media has changed so much. Honestly, you will not get me watching the mainstream media or even reading the newspapers now. And that's crazy for someone like me to say that. I mean, I lived in the mainstream media for 20 years. I read the newspapers every day. I watched all the news bulletins every day. No way now. I get my news from the people who I trust, usually via my mobile phone. And when I have to seek something out for research purposes, I will do it. And I think more and more people are heading in that direction. And actually, that can only be a really good thing for democracy, right? Yeah, of course. Because these big mainstream media organizations, I call them the British Bashing Corporation, Sly News, and Woke ITV, they're bad mm -hmm. for this country. And obviously, in America, you've seen it too. Look at CNN. It's dying on its ass because they became so obsessed with destroying Donald Trump over anything and the viewers saw through it i mean trump is going to be i mean look i think he's going to win again and he should win again and how can you say that he wasn't a great president but that's another thing that you literally barely hear in the mainstream media was it not one of the only president ever to start a war yeah absolutely i think the world would be a much safer place and i think the other the other big thing about the mainstream media is do you remember that at the end of donald trump's term they were all trying to say that he was senile right even though he was totally Biden's on his game when he's fucking well, off his head there's literally i mean we literally have a dementia ridden president right i mean he is literally not there the guy is senile and you have a media class covering up for him every day like i ge i'm genuinely so disturbed by that and they are treating him as if he can run for president for another four years why because they know he's not running the show he's a patsy and that's terrifying so so look i think um i think the independent media is going to be a huge force over the course of this election and I keep discovering new people. Like, I don't know if you've heard of her, but there's this woman who runs a brilliant substack called House in Habit, right? Mm -hmm. And she started off as an influencer and covering, like, the trials of Johnny Depp and, yeah, yeah. and people like that. And she is now one of the main sources of campaign news for both the Donald Trump and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. campaigns mm -hmm. via substack, where she has over 250,000 subscribers. I mean... That's more than most newspapers yeah. in the UK have, far more than The Guardian or The Daily Mirror. So I'm very inspired by people like that because I think what I can deliver now is total, unvarnished, unfiltered coverage. But what I can do is actually reveal why the MSM are doing the things that they've done. Because I've come from there. Do you yeah. see what I mean? I like know what they Anybody game who is. gets goes through that sort of stuff, I think it's getting more back in than ever because they know how the, the, the main media operate. Mm. And it's this is the thing about, for me, it's just sitting the fence, but also have your opinions when asked, but give an open view of every angle, both sides, not just one, not just the, just every okay. angle. And then it's fair. Because you've you've chosen sides in the day back in the day, and it doesn't really do you any justice, no. especially when the shit hits the fan with yourself. No, but the thing is, on GB News, right? I actually always had both sides of the stories story on, but every story, including, by the way, climate change. So I call it Nut Zero, the Nut Zero conspiracy. Now that's not to say that there isn't some changes to the environment, but we're basically being asked to impoverish ourselves. Now you know. On the BBC, for example, they'll never have someone questioning net zero. They only cover one side of that debate. So I absolutely agree. I think it's important to cover both sides. And I also think it's important for you to admit when you change your mind about something too. So Prince Andrew's an example of that. As I say, I started off absolutely thinking he was... Um, wrong. 
yeah, like, yeah. And, 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 and it was actually through my reporting on GB News where I was hearing the different voices and then I started doing my own investigation into it. Now, the mail didn't want me to write about that. You know, that went against the narrative. So I think you're completely right. It's only if you actually are open-minded to both sides of the story um, th that you do discover things. However, there are some fundamental issues for me about freedom and scientific reality and things where I think um, it's going to be hard to change my mind, but I'm what, open to it. What about uh, Andrew Brady? How, uh, he ended up in prison. How did yeah, that come about? Was he a stalker? Or, what, yeah, what, so, so this was all connected. So this was another reason why I was so shocked when the cancellation campaign against me happened last year because Brady had actually ended up in jail for making false allegations against me and stalking me. So he was a previous fiancé of Caroline Flack. But the thing is, he tried to buy into this narrative of me in some way... Um, being bad for Caroline. Well, that could not be further from the truth. So Caroline, I I only ever wrote a story about Caroline that she knew about and that she was happy about, right? I was very, very clear to her. I would never write something she didn't want. So she was the one who provided me what was going on with, with Andrew Brady. It had to be out there because he had done some really terrible things. And all I can think is that he couldn't get over his own guilt for what he had done. So, and hopefully this paints a picture of what we're dealing with here. So, you know, um, on that terrible night with Caroline and, and her then fiancé, um, where there ended up being the physical alt altercation oh, and... Blood. Yeah, and, and a lamp had been thrown, right? So Andrew Brady taunted Caroline over that so much, was trying to sell his story, claim that she was abusive to him and all, all of that, which I don't believe. But do you know, he was in Australia at the time. He sent Caroline a lamp in the post to arrive at her house to taunt her for the fact that she had apparently thrown this lamp. Well, the lamp didn't arrive until after she'd died. So this was the type of guy we were dealing with. I'm prepared to take a lot, but he was threatening physical violence. He clearly wasn't all there, and this was all being done on social media. And the police took it very, very seriously. And yeah, he ended up he ended up being jailed for it. I actually wish him well. Um again, I never I never understood it. I never understood it. Like he literally had been at events with Caroline and I. He knew that we were friends. He knew that we got on. He knew that we spoke to, that she spoke to me all the time. So why was he trying to create this narrative? He also knew, by the way, that he'd sent me messages trying to do the dirty on her and sell an interview on her. And I had literally turned him down and said, I have zero interest in doing that. So, yeah, he went to jail, but not for long. Four months? Yeah, and I... Because he was on Big Brother, he was on yeah, that plane. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just, it was nuts. And I wish him well. I'm very sad about what happened with him. Um, but again, I just, I never understood it. Look, it wasn't true. Nothing that he was saying was true. You know, he was saying absolutely crazy. I mean, he was comparing me to Hitler. It was nuts. But I think that guy, and again, like I'm nervous even talking about him because I worry, is it, I mean, I have like a five-year restraining order out against him. He's not able to be in the vicinity of me. You know, the judge has been very clear, you know, and I published my victim impact statement because I wanted to people to know the truth about Caroline and I, because no one actually knew the truth about it at that point. Um, 
and the judge was very clear, you know, if he says or does anything towards me again, he'll go back to jail, which presumably he doesn't want. But as I say, I wish him well. I want him to have a good, positive life. He should do. He was a talented guy. Things went wrong with Caroline. He's got a chance at a second life. Now, I believe he's got children and, and has a partner, and I wish him well. Um, but it's not fair to try and paint me as someone who was against Caroline. And certainly any suggestion that I was responsible for anything that happened to her um, negatively at the end. Basically, the Sun had published the picture. So, so this all comes from the fact the Sun published the picture of the bloody bed, right, um, where the incident took place. And again, this is completely factual. I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus, but I just have to tell the truth. I was in New Zealand when The Sun published that picture. I was on holiday. No one had told me about it. The reason no one had told me about it is they knew that I would have been absolutely disgusted and horrified and said, you cannot do that because I was in direct communication with Caroline, her manager, and her PR. And the moment that Sun front page dropped, her PR copied me on an email saying, what the, like with the Sun news desk saying, what the hell? And that was literally the first I knew about it. And I think it was an absolutely terrible decision to, to publish that picture, but it was nothing to do with me. It was nothing to do with me. Now, again, I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus, but I just have to be honest because people try and suggest that I was somehow involved in publishing that picture and I wasn't. The truth is I was in constant communication with Caroline. I was only publishing stories that she was happy with. And, and I still have the messages, you know, she had said to me that she wanted me to do her first interview once she was through the legal process. So I, I loved her a lot and I miss her a lot, but I also don't want to act as if I felt anywhere near the loss of her family or close friends or anything like that. But but it's just the, the narrative around um, what people have. And I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't get what people achieve by doing that. But all I, I, I guess I've tried to understand it. And as I say, I've never spoken about it until now. But personally, I've tried to understand it and through therapy and things like that. And I can only think that when someone dies like that in the most shocking way, People want to blame someone. They want to have one person to blame. And what happened to Caroline was so shocking. And I and I think people still are not over it. Um, but I but you will not find me. People, do you, do you know something that always goes around on on Twitter? I see it constantly. People say that I deleted a whole load of stories that 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 I ran about Caroline. No. They, the stories don't exist because I never wrote a negative word about Caroline. You will not find a negative word about Caroline from me. And actually, the one front page of The Sun that people sometimes show is one, I think the headline was something like Flack, Sack, ITV. I can't remember exactly what the headline is. But the headline looks as if it's a sensational headline, right, on the front page. As soon as you read the story... What the story was about was attacking ITV for the decision to sack Caroline when they had stood by Ant McPartland, you know, of Ant and Deck fame. Because, you know, I also did all of the interviews with Ant. Uh, I'm the only person he's ever spoken to about both times that he came through his big drug addictions. Drug um, driving? Yeah, so the, the first one was before that. And then there was the, so yeah, both of his big interviews and comebacks he, he, he did with me. But 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 the stories that I was were writing at that time was to say, sorry, ITV, how on earth can you stand by Ant, who I like a lot, but how can you stand by him, but you're not standing by Caroline? Like, and remember, Lewis, Caroline's fiance, he didn't want the charges to be pressed. Like, yeah. So so it's wrong. It's really unfortunate that this myth has been perpetuated because what it unfortunately has meant is that I've never been able to like celebrate my friendship with 
Caroline. Mm-hmm. So I've never been able to post about her, never been able to share any pictures of us together or anything like that because... If you do that now, people are just thinking you're doing it for to make out your friends. Yeah, and people are, people just attack me about it all the time. So I, as I say, this is the first time I've ever spoken publicly about Caroline and the Andrew Brady situation because for some reason people twisted and it's become this yeah like as i say like even some friends of mine have said that, like oh pe- my friends think that you killed caroline it's 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 hard it, that's really hard because as i say it was just could not have been further from the truth what makes a good journalist done so you've got to be prepared to question authority which i'm obviously very good at so that's never been a, a, tr- a trouble with me but you also really have to be prepared to give people a proper shot and play long games with contacts. So sometimes it's very easy to go for a quick story, right? A quick hit, you know? Um, but if you burn that person off, they're never going to trust you again. So you know like how I said no celebrities other than Lily Allen spoke out against me? I think it's because actually... I never was screwing people over, really. I, I, I played the long game. Didn't mean that you didn't want to write good stories. But I think the best journalists have contacts who trust them because then it means that you can go to them when something really bad happens or the shit hits the fan and they know that you're not going to mm-hmm. uh, turn you over. But I think but, but I think there are the two big things. Challenge the narrative always. Don't just accept what authority figures are telling you but then also find ways to build contacts they are the two big things because i think too many journalists now in both london westminster and washington dc they just follow the narrative all the time you know it's just whatever's been said at the podium at the white house whatever's been said in the daily briefing at number 10 and it drives me mad because so often they're being told lies but also bigger than that. So often what they're talking about is not what the country's talking about. And what it means is that stories that are so important have been pushed under the carpet for a long time. So the two examples I would use would be the grooming gangs and the um and the boats, you know, stopping the boats. It really took Nigel Farage, Tommy Robinson, GB News, and folk like me to actually put those stories on the national agenda because for a long time the mainstream media they just pretended it wasn't happening you know like and you see it in america now it's like any time that there's a shooting of of um white people for example it's just not covered you know so 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 often i think the media are ignoring stories so that's why i think good journalists challenge who changes just before we finish up but who changes a narrative to what they want to publish is it a, a big group behind that or is it, is it a free-for-all? Because when one media jumps on something, mm. the same old media jumps on it. They, so work, they work in packs. Do they? They work in packs. And I hate that. I never understood that because I always wanted to break stories myself, right? Partly probably because I was craving that success, which isn't necessarily not a, a bad thing. thing no. But also because I thought, you shouldn't just be doing something because every other newspaper is doing it. But what you'll see, like with the reporters at Westminster, for example, and also the reporters um, for the Royal Family, which are the, probably the two beats that I'm closest to, they're on big WhatsApp groups. They socialize together. They're pals. They hang out with their contacts. And they sort of develop narratives together. So quite often you'll see the same political story or the same royal story on the same day in the Times, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail. They might have a slightly different version of events, but they sort of feel like they're operating in a pack. Now, what I find exciting, though, is that those narratives can be changed, but it's hard. So an example of that that I would use would be the vaccine damage, the COVID vaccine injured. So that's something that for a long time, the mainstream media completely ignored, completely ignored. That you would be called a conspiracy theorist to even mention it, right? But folk like me did not give up. And there's other people I've got to call out for being brilliant on it, um, especially at GB News, Mark Stein and Bev Turner. But we kept on having the vaccine injured on our show. 
regularly. I kept on talking about it. I didn't just brush it under the carpet. You know, it's like this guy lost his leg because of the AstraZeneca vaccine. This woman lost her husband, a doctor, because he did the right thing and had the Pfizer. You know, so so we kept on talking about it. Mainstream media kept ignoring it. Then the other day at the GB News um, People's Forum with the Prime Minister, John Watt, who's one of the vaccine injured, actually posed a question to the Prime Minister. Yeah, no, John. Yeah, and for the first time, you know, I'd had him on my show, you know, good guy. But for the first time, I'm like, okay, it was still ignored, but... Over the last couple of weeks, I've started to see the Prime Minister change his rhetoric. People are starting to talk about the vaccine injured. You're not considered a conspiracy theorist now for raising it. So, look, this has been three years of work. We're not even close because this is a scandal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the vaccine injured is, is a scandal. But you can slowly but surely change narratives. It's not easy, though. And um, you don't always have a success. <laughs> and you need to go through some hard times to then push. Because the power of the voice, the the voice of the people is so stronger than anything. It's just we're so dumbed down and caught up in so much shit that we forget to ask the important questions. What the fuck is it all about? Yeah. How do you feel telling your story today? Oh my God. Well, it's so weird for me. You know, <laughs> it's so weird for me because usually I'm you. Yeah. Right. I've For years, I've been you. And I actually much prefer to ask the questions. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would love to. You're going to have to come on my show, anytime, by the way. Anytime, launch. anytime. But um, that, <laughs> that, that's a demand. But no, but it's, but also this has been cathartic for me, to be honest, because, you know, I was silenced for six months and um, I had to read the most terrible things about me without being able to respond. So I hope, do you know, like how you're talking about shifting narratives in the mainstream mm -hmm. media? Hopefully I can slowly shift some of the narrative about me not with my viewers because like my viewers they know me right they 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 know me they know it wasn't true but i hope to be able to reach people who maybe thought the worst of me do, do you know do yeah, you know what i mean but again people are always going to have there's you're never going to truly convince everyone anyway you no. can only just stay in your lane and be you and people who like you will gravitate towards you for me, people, it's a hit and miss with me. I don't care. I built up a platform and I know consistency is key. And I know the only person who cancels me is me. Yeah. I don't stop for no I'm one. I'm jealous of you. Yeah. And I, but I hope that in a year's time, I'm going to be able to say the same thing. Yeah, perfect. Going forward for the future, Dan, what's your plans? So the big plan is the launch of The Daily Show, mm -hmm. Dan Wilson Outspoken. So at the moment, there's a soft launch, like I'm doing videos, I'm doing interviews, I'm writing my columns all via my own platform. But my big, big goal is to have the show and to do what I did on GB News. But, and this is the big but, I will not be regulated by the off-communists. So I don't have to have someone on to provide the um sort of mainstream narrative just to appease the regulators if you see what i mean and i'll also be able to have much more in-depth conversations with people too because you know on tv we're literally like eight, eight minutes yeah. ad break eight minutes ad break eight minutes ad break so that's my big big goal so it's going to broadcast very soon but in the meantime i'm encouraging people to sign up because obviously i'm building the studio i'm getting um lots lined up but there's still lots of content but it's the show for me that's going to be the the big achievement because it's going to be every day you know it's going to be mm. a big it's a big undertaking mm -hmm. every day um lots of guests lots of content every day monday to friday but i truly truly believe um that there's this desire for it look what Piers has done yeah on of course it's fucking went mega yeah and he's two million followers yeah, he's got and, he, now. and with the Israel and Palestine, he knows how to no matter what it is, he knows how to manipulate the audiences to get them. He's very controversial, but he knows what he's playing. He's not like that off camera. He's playing it to yeah. a fucking team. People buy into it. Yeah. It's, it, it's a really exciting space. Like I look at what all of you guys are doing in that this space, and I'm like, I want to do it, but I guess in my own way, because I think. The difference between, say, what Piers is doing and what you're doing is that I want to have that regular show at the same time every day mm -hmm. that react that's live yeah, yeah. and reacts. But to that's the news what you're used to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I think it's what um, 
I think it's weird because obviously you're doing the brilliant interviews. Piers is doing the great debates. Do, do you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's where there's a gap in the market yeah. in the UK. Because as I say, if you want that sort of live news online, which isn't regulated and isn't on one of the news channels at the mm. moment, you've got to watch the American But more stuff. people are gravitating towards that stuff. Yeah. More people are aware of what's going yeah. on now. And this is the thing with all the shit with the lockdown three years ago. People are now questioning it. And there is a massive shift. So fair play to it. Dan, for anybody watching that's maybe in a life of struggle, what yes. advice would you have for them? Do you know what? I know it's so easy to say, but you've got to turn to your family and your old friends who know you. I'm saying that obviously because that's what I've just done, but I genuinely don't think I could have got through the last year if I wasn't surrounded by my absolute roots. And it wasn't easy for me because a lot of those people were in New Zealand, right? So reconnect, reconnect with the people who really know you. Because you know, in life, we get overwhelmed by the people who we're working with that particular day or our workmates who we go to the pub with, right? They are very often not the people who really know you. And I think where I have been so fulfilled over the past year and why I've been able to reconnect with myself reevaluate decisions I've made and get stronger is because I turned to the people who knew me before I was in this career. Do, do, do you see what I mean? And yeah. I think too many people, look, it may be too simplistic because I know times can be so tough, but I do think it will help. I think it will help. Don't lose touch with your family if you possibly can. Reconnect with your school friends, the people who you went to university with, the are the people who really know you. And also, Biggest thing that I learned, they're the ones who really have your back. Dan, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for giving me all the time. Well, and obviously, please sign up www.danmortonoutspoken.com or just Dan Morton Outspoken on mm -hmm. YouTube. Yeah. You know, find me on YouTube because there is going to be this show coming and I hope you'll enjoy it. Dan, listen, thanks for coming on. Terrible and plug, I'm so sorry. That's, listen, that's <laughs> business. But listen, you've got a clean sheet now. Now it's just a case of how far you want to take it and Thank what you, you so want to do. Well. I wish you all the best so for the future, Dan. Take Great care. see you.